Today, we're going to talk with Vincent Ward. Pasta awaits. The pasta awaits. Welcome, uh, Vincent <laughs> Ward. So, can you? Uh, I have a question for both of you. When's the first time that you met? Wow, Vincent, do you remember? Your eyes met across no. a crowded bordello. What was it? No, no. Was it a film festival? Was it at a film festival? I don't know. I, I'm sure it was Mickey who introduced us. Yeah, it would be. It would have been Mickey. Mickey Cottrell, publicist in Los Angeles. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. And yeah, must have been cool. in the late eighties. Late eighties. Um, I was in an hotel back then. No, was in a. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really good to go into detail. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought. You were in. You I were dressed in black. Spent. I was dressed in red. <laughs> Well, oh, how yes. my memory cheats me. No, Scott, was you and me. <laughs> yeah, that was me. Well, it's true. I had the crush on him. So, uh, and so, uh, okay. no, I un I understand why you you had a crush on him. I understand why both of you would have crush on each other. You're both you're both kind of you're both quite extraterrestrial. Yes. You know, no, no, no. I mean that in the best. No Never called me that. No one's ever called me that. <laughs> well, well, no, unusual. You, no, you're you. They when used I Spielberg could have cast me. <laughs> no, no, no. Listen, I'm going to tell you why it's extraterrestrial. It's like terrestrial, but extra. <laughs> if there's one particular thing which is a kind of common, um, a, a sort of visual thread through your your films is this idea of the sort of like the overgrown kind of nature, planet, moss-covered, damp, sort of the quiet, ancient wood of existence so the, <laughs> but no 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 the, there's a certain element to that do you see yourself like that Vincent? there's a baroqueness in the kind of organicness tell me if i'm wrong it could be one aspect i also like funny hats you know <laughs> so i put my always put my actors in funny hats no seriously um i grew up on a farm in new zealand which was uh for me, moderately remote uh, in that my mother was a refugee from Germany. She'd been in the British Army in World War II. My father had been in the New Zealand Army. They met in Syria after my father had three quarters of his body burnt. Um, the terrain was very harsh. When they returned from World War II, they didn't have any money. My dad was an older guy for a soldier. And... Um, he was still having skin grafts. Sorry, this got quite serious. And uh, and he broke in the land at times with a flamethrower because he had an old... I remember the flamethrower he used to keep under the garage table. This is a man with all his body burnt. And, uh, and his fingernails were all buckled like this. And uh, he's a big guy. And, yeah, so he broke in this terrible piece of land that had been used for gunnery practice in World War One. And for me, the terrain is a long answer. The terrain was like his body. It was and and as if this damaged body were, you know, with bush and cliffs and erosion and with um, parts of the cliffs cascading down into the river that went at the end of one part of the pro property and all this go terrible gorse, you know, prickly gorse that just spreads everywhere and this guy alone with his axe uh was trying to break on this terrain they had they lived in this tiny little hut on wheels no bigger than a t tiny tool shed and my mother would go and crap in the gorse bush outside and one stage um managed to somehow nearly burn that hut down <laughs> and then shortly afterwards they about it was three years before she got an overcoat because they they just didn't have the money and uh, a three, no, sorry, three children before she got an overcoat. She'd had three children. Um, so 
yeah, it was my, my, in answer to your question, my mind was shaped by this man with these corrugated hands and, and damaged body and this landscape that was also corrugated and damaged and windswept and raining. So I'd see him coming in at night after long, long days because the main farm was quite away from where, was a mile away from where our house was, eventually was. And he'd be covered in water from the rain and had blood on his hands normally where he cut himself or something. Um, and so that the images of him and the land fused in my imagination and the stormy, the stormy bushy, bush environment. Um, so, and I always thought that my father tried to carve this land into the perfect shape that in his mind, my mother was. So mm. this young, beautiful woman, um, you know, much younger than him, um, he always tried to shape that land into her body. That was always in my mind somehow. I don't know how that came about in my head, but that's what that was the afterimage I was left with. Yeah, there's a there's a, there's a sort of womb, sort of a womb like quality to the the worlds that you make. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of um, there's sort of most of the time people move away from the the sort of. The, the the grimy and the textured and the untouchable <laughs> and all of those things but it certainly seems to be something which you've always been that that, that seems to be a thread running through it we we found out but you did a film with the quay brothers there's another there's there's almost a their their interest lies obviously the fact that they're twins but there's and then their own sort of own duality but the this other world behind the world mm -hmm. and that seems to be a sort of common I'm not sure that was me. Um, there is a no. That uh, was very Vincent... much them. I don't want to get all Elvis Mitchell on you, but <laughs> there seems no, to no, be no. No, no. But there is a Vincent Ward who's a a, a a black actor or black director, I think, um, who is um, you know been in quite a lot of movies. I think as an actor, there's also I'm not sure whether there's another director with the same name. Also, could be. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, you, I think you, I think you misunderstood what I was saying. No, no. Vincent Vincent Ward and the the um, uh, yeah. I I know who the Vincent Ward is because I was looking for pictures of you and and there's a black actor called Vincent Ward who pops up a lot who was in The Waking Dead amongst other things. But do you know the Quay Brothers? Yeah, I do, and I love their work, and I and I I understand exactly what you're talking about. That odd myopic world. And there's there's elements of there's elements of sort of Terry Gilliam. There's that kind of uh, um, a very a very different filter or prism through which to look at the world. Uh, well, the imagination, no, I think. Uh, well, I think it's rich a, imagination. What's more than that? It's a sort of there, there's a kind of organicness and a texture that you don't normal mm -hmm. normally find. Mm -hmm. That is this this um, that, that that finds the the kind of the rough edges of the mm -hmm. what could be considered mundane otherwise. Uh, the, the 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 reality of your life is very interesting uh, because you know you've been a writer, a director, uh, you produce movies, you um, uh, you also dedicate yourself to to art, to painting, photography. Uh, seems you are no interested on on really expressing yourself, right, Vincent? Well, I get to... bored with one thing and then I, but I like to make. I simply it's quite simple. I just like to make things, you know. Mm -hmm. For eight eight years, I lived in a industrial warehouse. Uh, there was, um, uh, yeah, my my marriage split up, and my my friend's marriage split up in the same week. And he well, I had young kids, so I was very upset about it. And he had um, his his wife ran away with the Tahitian policeman with the largest dope plantation in Tahiti. Um, in that same week, and I, we were lived about a hundred meters away. And he said, "Well, you can stay in my warehouse." So even though I owned three houses at that time in different countries, I had returned to New Zealand, and I decided to live in a in an in the industrial warehouse warehouse on a shelving rack, two um two three levels up, which you could only get to by ladder, and where I used paint drops to surround myself. And in the morning, I'd get out. There was a forklift right near where I slept and a lot of workbenches. 
and it was extremely cold in the winter because it was not insulated. And I'd just make things. At the same time, I had a working office because um, he had a great he allowed me to have a great office and facilities. So um, I I like to be in the middle of making things. I like I'd rather live in a tool shed than in like this where I'm living now. It's extremely fancy because we made everything. But once I've made it, I'm totally bored by it. I see, I get the impression <laughs> that you've you you. Uh... You you have a deep mistrust of comfort. That I um, not really. I kind of get bored with it. You know, it's kind of you become desensitized. You know, the 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 idea. Well, I mean, it's obviously for everything you talked about about gr- growing up in a in the kind of the violated earth of the that farm is is Ooh, the good idea. Word. That, well, it it's it's kind of the. There is a certain thing that happens to us all when we're we're growing up, where we, the the there's things that we get used to. It's why people are attracted to terrible relationships because they knew that when they were growing up and they become comfortable in misery. Mm-hmm. And there's a certain physical discomfort which which is kind of which is sort of heartening, you know, the bracing cold in the morning. It's a bit chilly at night. The bed's a little too hard, you know. All of those particular no, but th- there's other things that that uh, mm-hmm. that are important. Is they stop us from becoming desensitized to you know to beauty, which is another and thing. The, the human yeah. condition. Yeah, and it, which is another thing that you kind of pursue, right? And on all your things, no. Yeah, I well, here's the story for you. I I went I went I got sent away to a boarding school to a Catholic boarding school. And I had, um, I'd had a series of concussions um, from the time I was six, uh, and I, I had uh, uh, falling around. I had a really st- stupid accident, fell on the back of my head, um, and I got concussion. And I was at that time I was, I was like probably fifteen. I was top of my grade and I was captain of, you know, of seven rugby teams and, and, and captain of my team. And, um, the rector of the school, who's this huge fat guy, wandered into my hospital ward on the third day of being in hospital. And he had a big pile of comics. And I, even, even I, naive as I was, boy from the country, even I realized something was up. Because this guy, he, he was antisocial. Um, he was known as Fat Pig by all the students. And for him to come to the hospital with a pile of comic, comics meant I was in serious trouble. And he said, OK, well, here are the comics. But the bad news is you're banned from rock, um, boxing, amateur wrestling and rugby because I like these physical sports with physical engagement. Um and so I went and I spent all my days in the art room and that head act injury, um, the sixth head injury I'd had, um, meant that I didn't like watching sports, they were really frigging boring, meant that my career changed and then I went to another school and I did well at art and then I went to art school. So I've always had this, um, and I, I'd always, as a child, there was another aspect to this love of beauty, which was as a child, I'd always draw because there was no one else around apart from when I was at school. So I'd spend my time drawing my father's damaged hands, for example. And in the ugliness of his hands, I found incredible beauty because he was incredibly a very, very kind person um, and very capable and very articulate. Um, so I've always had this interest in creating things of beauty. And what? Which and stemmed also, from, and, from and, with what? Sorry, what? Which which stemmed largely from these things of beauty stemmed both from my own injury ultimately, and also one of the things that have been inspiring were my father's injuries. So it always it came out of this strange strange space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And finding finding the finding the aesthetic in in what everybody thinks is is ugly the, the or or is frightening to people or they don't understand it how fascinating yeah the the beautiful wound 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. It, it's it's sort of it's sort of the idea of well, it's it's like the whole idea of um, of free will, self determination, the idea of the universe conspired to make you not only see those things but actually be in a position where you could share them and show them. Um, how how um, it, it's I always think the older you get, the less the less easy is it, it is to consider the fact that everything's at, everything is completely random. <laughs> There's a, the the greatest coincidence that we ever experienced, uh, and well, certainly in my life, maybe you've had more of this. But we were in London staying, and does he? Who, does I don't know. Do you know who Don Ranvo is? Yeah, or, or rather was. was I just was. know Don Ranvo. Okay, so you know Don. He died a few years back. Bless him. Um, yeah. What well, we were living in his basement in Castle Terrace in uh, West Kensington, and Paula, who's a sometimes agent's daughter, who was there studying English. She, um, um, Alcira, her agent, said, speak to Paula. She has a script for you. It was 1994. Nobody faxed scripts. Nobody emailed scripts. It didn't exist then. Um, she has a script for you. Here's a number. Call her. Sumta called her up, and she said, where are you? And she says, I'm in West Kensington. She says, oh, my goodness, so are we. We're in West Kensington. That's amazing. She said, what street? You must be nearby. She said, we're in Castle. I'm in Castle Terrace. And she said, well, we're in Castle Terrace. What number are you at? And she said, 33. And then she said, what floor? And she said, I'm in the fourth floor. <laughs> and we said, we're in the basement. <laughs> and she said, I'll just bring your script down to you. Then. <laughs> in all of London. Oh, in, in, all, in all of London. Yeah, we actually have, no, not even the same street, the same bit. Yeah, she was yeah. literally... 15 meters away making the phone call. So that was the, the, the house of Don Rambo. And of course, Don Rambo didn't know the, the other person. So it was completely, uh, you know, in a... None of it made any sense whatsoever. Made any but, sense. but there's a strange, there's a strange pattern to things. And I sometimes think that when we're, when we're creative, because I think it must be hard. There's a certain thing that I call the, uh, the, the, uh, the Lucas Coppola syndrome, which is when directors, film directors, get to the stage where nobody's saying no to them. They, they, they just start making absolute rubbish because one of the things that makes us creative is the obstacles and the difficulties and the fact that it's cold in the morning and the bed's uncomfortable <laughs> and and the fact that there's there's a whole lot of other people going, no, you can't do that or I don't think we should be able to do that or no, 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 we don't have the money, the time, the resources, whatever, which is for which forces everybody to make them to make them comfortable, you know, to make them make them much more creative. So when did when did you when did you how did you transition from going to art school and pure art to actually visual storytelling and film? Because it wasn't like you could use your cell phone back in the day. I mean, it was a very difficult and different proposition. Well, I kind of I went to this art school in the south of the country, and in Canterbury there were only two art schools in the country then. It was hard to get into, and uh, you. After the first year, I started, I, I hated the other, I didn't like a couple of the lecturers in doing sculpture and painting. So I, I, I started specializing in animation. <clears throat> and, um, and then I, I kind of ended up making these short films. And one of them won two film festivals and uh, one in Chicago and uh, one and one in France, and and then this guy came. This these two critics happened to come to New Zealand, and both of them <clears throat> happened to see this film. And then suddenly, this film and the next film I made while I was still at art school. And then suddenly they were written about in the LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, um, and various other American newspapers. And I was I was ended up on a tour in the US doing small doing five small repertory houses screening the films. <clears throat> so I suddenly had this <clears throat> reputation and I was still at university. So um, so I made my first feature and then that was accepted for competition at Cannes. My second feature was accepted for competition at Cannes and my third feature was accepted an official selection at Cannes. <clears throat> so I suddenly had this little bit of a career or quite a bit of a career really. And, um, and I was... I started going to Los Angeles and getting offered American scripts. Mostly I didn't like them. I, I was naive in thinking they would might do what I wanted to do. But of course, yeah. that does seldom happened. Um, yeah, I remember that. That was 1988, no, more or less, when we met, right? Yeah, that was after my second yeah. feature. Uh-huh. Um, 
second full feature that I'd done two short features at, when I was at university. So, um, so I went backwards and forwards. I got involved in Alien Three. I worked on that for a year. <clears throat> they said, "Would you do this? Uh, would you do this film? We want something quite original because I had a reputation for doing quite original material." Uh, and I said, "No, I don't really want to do a remake or anything. Thank you very much." And uh, that was a big thing because Alien Three had had as its predecessors, Ridley Scott and James Cameron. So to be offered that was a big deal. I I was sort of sufficiently myopic that I didn't kind of, I don't really care. Um, and they said, well, if you could bring whatever you want to it. And I said, okay, so at least come over for a visit. So I hopped on the plane. On the plane, I had an idea. I wrote a story. By the time I got to LA, I had it written up in three pages and I presented it to them. Um, and they decided to do it. After a year, um, the the studio had been bought out, and the what? After a year of working on it, we were building sets in London and so on. Um, they decided they wanted something much safer and less adventurous, and so they started behind my, you know, kind of behind my back, compromising it and taking out of it everything I liked. So I went off and did another film instead, um, and because I don't really compromise, you know, I'm not in that sort of way. I, I, if, it's, if it's not worth making, I don't make it. You know, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather, you know, do something else. Um, and we went to the Canadian Arctic and started making a feature film there in Canada and uh, in Quebec, Canada, and the Canadian Arctic and in London. And that's something that, that you cool. wrote at the same time that you were developing the other thing, or how? yeah, we'd already developed. My co-writer and I, Louis, we we developed this project for quite a while, so I was quite lucky because when um, when it looked like Alien Three was going to go pear shaped, and I couldn't see how it get, I, I I never thought they made a good film out of it because they what the essence of it they managed to destroy, um, even though they brought on a, a very good director, David Fincher. Um, I was lucky. I was able to go straight into this, this, um, this other film with um, with working title. Uh, you, uh, in you, fact, the leading actress was partly inspired by you, Asunta. The leading don't tell character. Me, don't tell me that because if you didn't get me, it was for something. <clears throat> And Sumta has a long history of that sort of thing. Michael Ondaatje was thinking of her when he wrote The English Patient. <laughs> you inspired her when you wrote Map of the Human... It's Map of the Human Heart we're talking about, right? Yeah. You know. Hey. Yeah, don't tell me are that. You, are you serious <laughs> about Michael Ondaatje? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. Uh, yes. Well, they're kind of related. The two stories are related, in fact. The, um, the English Patient and Map of the Human Heart are... I uh, do have a kind of, um, you know, there's similarity in content in some ways. Yeah, I mean, they were both different. inspired by her. <laughs> that's what that's what they have in common. Your fault. It's your fault, Asunta. That's my yeah. fault now. And These yeah. works of art come out. It's yeah, she fault. didn't even get on the call sheet, for goodness sake. <laughs> well, well, oh, so well. so tell, tell me this idea, because a lot of people are going to be interested in this, the whole Alien 3. You're very famous. Everybody is aware of your connection with the script. What is the process of being attached to writing something like it, as it was back in the day, Alien 3 for, for an entire year? What, what's the process? They call you up every week and they go, how's it going? Can we see some pages? What are they no, doing? No, no, no. They, they, it was, you see, the thing was um, when Murdoch, who bought uh, Fox, took over, and even before then, Alien, the Alien franchise, um, let's, oh, let me rewind a second. When, with the original Alien, there was no pressure on it because it was just this science fiction film. No one expected any a genre film. No one expected anything of it. Um, it just came from left field. It was very lucky to be made. and But Ridley had done such an extraordinary job of it, and it became this huge hit, much to everybody's surprise. But by the time I came along, Alien 2 had been a huge hit and there was this massive expectation on Alien 3 that it would be the flagship film for Fox in the, in the summer that would follow. It would be the film that, the tentpole film, right? Yeah. And so everybody 
seemed to want their hand in it. And but they done like something like six or seven scripts, and all the scripts had, were a rehash of the first two, so they were kind of boring. Um, and so that's why they came to me. So they came to me to direct the film. They would be very happy if I took any one of their scripts, and went along with that. I didn't like their scripts, so um, I was hired as a director first, and then I just happened to have come up with a script, and they happened to, have, in theory, green lighted it. So they, we went simultaneously into active pre-production, soft pre-production, and uh, and and at the same time we were working up the the script and various drafts. So we started designing the sets. I had a team of illustrators on, um, so it's quite a different sit situation from a normal script development deal. It was active. This film had a release date already. Wow. It hadn't been fully written, but it had a release date. We had to go like hell to try to get everything into production in order to meet that date. What, what do you so what happened when the other director came? Uh... Oh, that was long after I'd left. Basically, with the, with the studio, they said, we want to change your idea. I said, no. That was that, you know. So... Of course, um, so they then went with the same story. I still had a story credit on it. I didn't like what they did. He had the same problems um, in that they started rewriting behind his back. And um, <clears throat> uh, and so Fincher, you know, wasn't happy with what he did either. Uh, and did he should, you have, talk, pulled did, did he should you... have pulled out. It's the only film he's, that he said he should not have done. And uh, and I made the same choice. I mean, I made the choice of I decided not. To, I didn't want to do it. Did you talk about that with him? He. I don't know him. No, you don't. I've worked with an editor on a large commercial, but I've I've ne I don't know him personally. No. What about what and, about? Uh, he followed like I, you know we didn't intersect. I was already gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. about with James Cameron? Because he spent a lot of time in New Zealand. Did you ever? You but ever... that was much later. I still don't know James Cameron, even though he owns a farm. Um, about 20 miles from where I grew up in, in, oh, the, wow. in the country. How strange. And he owns a shop in the, my hometown. He owns a health, you know, a health food shop in my, in my hometown because he's a health food aficionado. Wow. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's quite impressive. Uh, Think, things I never expected. What does James Cameron do apart from make films about blue aliens? Well, he's a big fan of tofu <laughs> and, uh, and dietary exactly. supplements. And has a, exactly, and has a farm in the southern Wairarapa. Wara wow. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's 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 very it's very interesting because um, what with Alien Three, what was your what was the thing that they removed? Um, your yours was famously well, my, monks in space. That was the kind of well. It, I mean, that's the sort of like the oddly ironic um, abbreviation of it. Uh, it because it wasn't a fast you know uh basically i had this idea of a like a contem contemporary group of monks um who have not their backstory was that they had they were minimalist in their in their beliefs they believed that you had to do live a harsh and difficult life in order to obtain salvation. So they were similar to second century monks in Turkey, right? In mm -hmm. Cappadocia or somewhere like that. And uh, stylites and so on. And they had become a pain in the ass for the, for the, for the ruling people in the particular uh, territory they came from. And with their monastery, they had been towed into space and left to rot. Mm. The, the, the monastery, which was circular, was uh, had a cladding to protect it from, uh, you know, going through the Earth's atmosphere. And that had gradually fallen away, revealing a largely wooden infrastructure, Gothic infrastructure, with a Cappadocian style monastery but you know like but not decorative like gaudi but an odd shaped 
monastery and and um and layers with windmills and also you know antiquated technologies that they ran and into their midst they were in the east they see a star and they think it's their salvation because it's an all male environment and they're aging and the last supply ship hasn't come for many years and in the east at the beginning the monks on the surface of this planetoid which creates its own artificial uh, gravity and atmosphere mm -hmm. which is created it does have a nuclear style infrastructure and some it, so it has a kind of hidden infrastructure to um, to operate credibly and scientifically um, with it at its core right um, so in the east is this starship the, they think it's their salvation and of course it's not and so it mayhem develops on the monastery rip, that lands on a artificial lake on the surface of this environment um the, the contents of the of the capsule are everything's pretty much destroyed this this um newt is dead and this one body is extracted who's still breathing uh which turns out to be ripley they start to see <clears throat> Terrible things happening, and the, and and um, they think it's the devil. They they believe it's the devil, and they go to their ancient books to try to uncover how do you destroy the devil. But of course, it's a you know organism, and um, and a relationship forms between one of the more uh, scientifically orientated monks and Ripley. Um, and there's a kind of trial where she's tried um, for bringing, for <clears throat> basically being a woman, but but essentially for bringing in this evil with her, the evil woman is on to her. Yeah, you were the very you were the, evil. Yeah, you were the inspiration there as well, obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah, again, again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another film that you inspired, but weren't in. I don't think so. <laughs> um, it's quite, it's, so I mean, was the, it's, that was the setup for it. And they, to answer your question, they wanted to, they got scared of a religious theme in it. Um, I mean, they would have been scared of Name of the Rose. So, you know, how stupid is that? Um, so, um, uh, and they wanted to change it to a mining planet. And I, what I, we'd done a lot of work on the design of this world, which was very, very cool and different. And, you know, because in a normal science fiction film, you press one button and it does a thousand, one thousand things. In this film, you have a thousand monks do one thing. So it's the kind of reverse of normal, uh, the normal th theory of science fiction. Uh, and they just got a little bit scared of it at that time. They were like, you know, I mean, Hollywood copies, it doesn't create anything new unless you've done sort of billion dollar grossing films. It, it always copies to so always a long way behind, normally a long way behind the times when you say they you know the studio um who who were they who were like oh well i don't want to badmouth anything i mean there were there were three producers on it they had been attached to the always attached to the film they were basically very nice guys um but they were under instruction from the studio as murdoch got more uh you know they wanted to make sure they had this huge hit and their B belief in a huge hit is to copy a combination of one and two. Well, we we all know that that's not a particularly good recipe for success. What have been great about those first two films is that they were quite each quite different. If, yeah, and so they were each one was surprising based on what had happened in the previous film. Um, Alien One was surprising because it had a woman in the lead, um, and basically was a horror film small haunted house film in outer space alien 2 was an action infantry movie where sigourney becomes or ripley becomes you know like an infantry person um and kills a lot kills a lot of creatures and a alien 3 was you know um sort of again more suspense orientated unlike the cameron movie and was meant to be. I mean, I'm not saying what it ended up with. It ended up as a kind of mess. And, um, uh, you know, 
a sort of what happens in the monastery when things go terribly wrong and monks keep disappearing. So, um, but mainly what I was interested in was creating this vast, this unusual world that I hadn't seen before. The uh, the curious thing is just you saying that is putting it in that particular context. Then what happens to, has to happen to Ripley is Ripley has to become Joan of Arc. Yeah, that was the idea, <laughs> and I read up widely on Joan of Arc. Exactly. Yeah, very that's specific. that's that's the logical thing that that she has to do to that's negate the, story. the negation. That's yeah, the story. exactly. Yeah, the exactly. the least in the first. And she one, has her hair trimmed. I mean, in in the story I'd written, I mean, in the finished film, she had a short haircut for no particular reason but in in this film her hair w- was cut you know similar to um you know falconetti and and the cow dry film yeah it's uh, the, 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 what's very interesting in terms of gender politics which is all anybody ever talks about and the curious thing is that when people say oh women don't want to people don't want to see female action heroes the one that's, the two that are always cited is sarah connor and ripley uh, as being the two sort of uh, the you know the the in recent memory female action heroes, and uh, one of the great parts aspects of those those particular female characters is their vulnerability, and the fact that their vulnerability gets that very vulnerability becomes the actual why they're so strong at the end. Yeah, it's what why we project on them so so. Well, isolated. yeah, and why it's completely you know male female is completely agnostic towards it. Everybody is everybody yeah. buys into its mythology. Yeah, and that's the difference now that everybody is like. It's a shame. A I mean, hero. that's 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 <laughs> that, that's quite an exciting story. Um, no, just uh, you know. it gained this sort of following, and then there was a book came out called "The Grand, Greatest Science Fiction Films Never Told" uh, by an English writer, and it, on, online that. Uh, was it advertised as being the number one film, science fiction film that was never made? Although I was given a story credit for that movie. Well, I mean, in you... fact, I'll, t- I'll tell you a story about that. I'll yeah. tell you a story about. It. I-, I want us to be able to talk about what dreams may come. So I don't know how much time. Well, time you want? All the time. Yes. We're not in any. Okay. Hard. Well. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I was living in LA and I was doing a bit of acting. Um, this is after Map of the Human Heart and that. Alien 3 debacle, and uh, I was living above Mickey and Mickey Cottrell, who we talked about last week, and I didn't have any income, but I employed people, Um, so I started to have a small development company, and I had run out of money, and one of the auditions I'd gone to, I'd hit a truck, and so that was six months before, and I was still driving the car around with the huge um, smashed up area in it and I was amazed it still worked because I couldn't afford to repair it. And then one day this this um, guy came along in a black limousine and kind of slicked back oily hair and, and so on and he said oh, I can fix I can do the panel beating for a hundred dollars. Only this is in Hollywood, somewhere along maybe like this Hollywood Boulevard or something like that. I don't know, somewhere around there, because my office was near Hollywood Boulevard. Mm-hmm. And it was, so he drove around to my apartment and he started to get a little gas bottle out of the car. And he got, um, and so he, he started to blowtorch it with this little portable gas bottle. <laughs> and he had little bottles of spray paint. It was the worst. <laughs> Possible. It looked much worse after he'd finished than it did when it had the damage, right? I paid him his hundred dollars and he he's my French fucked off. So um <laughs> so that was the sort of situation I was living in. And it was my I just split up from my girlfriend and I it was Thanksgiving and I bought this turkey, but it was a cheap turkey, but it was massive. It's the largest frozen turkey I've ever seen. But when I got it home, I couldn't fit it into my fridge because I didn't have a very big fridge. <laughs> so and I also bought a um, Native American tomahawk. And so I was, up, I, I was upset because I had no money. I had a fucked car. Excuse my French. I My girlfriend had left. 
<laughs> and I had a turkey that didn't wouldn't go in the fridge, and I had no way of getting it in the fridge. And it was Thanksgiving, and I was on my own, and I was feeling miserable. So I started hitting the turkey with the axe <laughs> to see if I could chop it up. This is lying sitting on the floor, I was hitting it with a fucking axe, right? <laughs> and and uh, with tomahawk. I'm smashing at it, but it would keep slipping off the ice of the turkey, right? The turkey would skitter away, and I started crying. Right? I'm crying, and I'm trying to hit the fucking turkey, and the turkey's getting all over the bit, right? and bits of wing are coming off, but I can't cut the damn thing, and it won't go in the damn fridge, and I'm broke, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and what am I doing in bloody Hollywood anyway? I hate frigging Hollywood, you know, it's so not me, you know? And... So anyway, I managed to get through the weekend and um, the bits of shaved turkey ended up in the fridge because I couldn't cut it properly. And um, and I didn't cook it in the end anyway because I didn't have anything much to cook of roast turkey with. <laughs> and in the morning of Monday morning, I went down the stairs to the letterbox right near Mickey's doorway and I picked up an envelope and the envelope's marked 20th Century Fox, and I go, oh, what the frig do these people want with me? So I opened up, opened it up, and there was a residual check for ninety thousand dollars US dollars in it. <laughs> One nine or <laughs> nine thousand? I had no idea 90, 90, that 000. I was owed. Wow. Yes. I had no idea that I was owed any money because my agent had said, oh, you don't have any residuals because he didn't make the film. Yeah, you did the story, but you know, you did a story for it, which you hate, and um. And then, you know, and so at the time I was going to, I'm not, don't know, don't know that I'm answering any questions, but at the time I was going to improv classes, which I loved. So here, here I'm, uh, you know, because I was going to auditions, I was getting a few gigs as an actor and, uh, and I thought, oh, well, I better learn a bit more of the craft. I'd always been going to acting classes from the time I was 14, uh, but short classes and this and that, because I love acting. Yeah, you I'm, have to talk I'm, afterwards I'm very, about the improv. Well, we'll talk about that later, yes. So I started going to the improv classes, and, and well, we can talk about that later, but I just want to tell yes, you one yes. story, because the, yes, yes, the, yes, yes, I just, cause about being down and out in LA, so that's the theme of it. And, uh, and I'd go along, and there'd be like 20 or so people in the classes, and this guy called Stephen Book, who's written a book called Book on Acting, on Improvisation, uh, was taking the classes, very good coach. And we would always be up on the floor doing stuff. And no one, I made a point of not, ne not telling anyone I was a director. I always, they just thought of me, oh, here's this down and out New Zealand actor, out of work mm -hmm. actor. He can't get a job to save himself. I think he's been in something or a couple of things, but nah. And there were some quite well-known actors th at the time there who had their own television shows, to, you know, um, because it was mainly not comedy, it was mainly um, drama, but these two guys were comedy orientated and each had their own show. And um, and I'd have a ball because I think I'm not normally funny, but because I'm kind of serious, serious sort of person, but I was funnier than them. I know I was funnier than them. Maybe that's an actor's ego, right? And, <laughs> and, and because I had, the stakes were absolutely low. I'd have this intense work, working week with the three people that worked for me. I'd go along to the class and I just let my hair down, you know, I could do anything. I didn't give a shit, you know, I didn't, I had no, you know, it wasn't my primary career. And so um, I just had a ball and no one expected anything of me because I was just, you know, this crazy New Zealander. So um, that was the situation I found myself in. And then I, I, had been developed i had started to get a i had a development deal with one of the minor studios <clears throat> and we had developed for three years i've been develop developing what had become the last samurai but so i did um we did many drafts on it and i worked with three the three different writers i was involved with um and eventually the segues back into your story about uh women in American films at that time, not so much now. And I developed this sort of character called Merritt, who was anything who had no merit, who was like a used car salesman who'd been in the Civil War. And just like similar to the character that Tom Cruise plays. And uh, basically, I got kind of bored with him because I'm I like making 
many of my films have women as a central character. So um, I developed a translator who was English and she never translated. She spoke fluent Japanese. She was in Japan, it's 1872, and uh, she never translates what he says. So she's always putting him into an awkward situation. <laughs> so I, mine had a slightly more ironic um, bent to it. I mean, after all, Tom Cruise uh, winning battles in Japan in 1872. Give me a frigging break, you know? I mean, an American playing a samurai in 1872, they did, I mean, unless he had, uh, you know, was a very good rifleman, you know, yeah, that would be more credible. credible. <laughs> but with a sword, no way. Um, and there's no history of anything like that. Americans went to Japan at that time. They, they trained what were called Ashigaru, which were uh, working class soldiers, peasants to become soldiers. And that was a big game changer, but not um, not quite as it was in The Last Samurai. But nonetheless, I, the basic story I came up with, well, not didn't come up with, I developed from with a range of writers. And I had a very good relationship with that. Story. So with the woman thing, um, I wanted to feature this woman in the studio. I said, no, we don't want a woman as a lead. We don't think it'll, it'll do as much business. So I said, okay, well, I'll find you a director and I'll act as a, a you know, executive producer on it and so that's what I did I went to Ridley Scott I went to Francis Ford Coppola and I um and I went to Ed Swick and Ed Swick was the one that said yes and then <clears throat> and then that film just went into development and I did another film with the same company um we were reading scripts Bedford five Falls scripts no a week. yeah that's it, Bedford Falls yeah so I did so that took many years to finally get to fruition i recommended they film in new zealand which they did i suggested where they film which was a place called um used to be called mount egmont which looks exactly like, like mount fuji they went there and filmed but that was not until the 2000s so we're still back in mid 1990s and uh i started i this very good writer First of all, my agent, who's this like really top agent at CAA, which was the main agency at that time, um, he suggested I meet this writer. So I met this writer, and his name was Ron Bass, who's like an A-list screenwriter, who's getting at that time a lot of money for for oh, each yeah. screenplay. It was like a million bucks a script, uh, which was a lot then. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, he showed me what he had. I didn't like many of them, although he's a very good writer, and he had one idea and they couldn't figure out how to make it. Um, they'd been trying for the producer of it, Stephen Simon and Barnett Bain, had been trying for 20 years to get this film made, the script into a film. And it was um, based on a Richard Matheson short story. Richard Matheson is this brilliant science fiction writer, absolutely brilliant. And so it was about a man who dies who um, no, it was about a man whose wife dies and he pines for her i did all these films about longing at that time and uh i was much more romantically inclined than i am these days mm -hmm. and man who died man whose wife dies he dies himself in an accident and basically what follows is orpheus um the man tries is in paradise in the afterlife and uh, he, well, actually, I've got the story wrong. It's so long since I've made it. He dies, and then mm. he's in the afterlife, and he tries to reach down to her, who's still alive, and she's a painter, and he and uh, he can't bring her back, and then she commits suicide, and he goes to hell to find her. Mm. Sorry, it's terrible. You can't mm. even remember the story of your own movies. <laughs> um, so, but it's, it's, oh. there's a there's a there's a real there's a real aspect. You know, I mean, maybe it's Jungian. I don't know. It's the idea, and it has to do with your mother. It's the it's the the female figure as as the unknowable inspiration for character. The idea that it's somebody who's always slightly out of reach and unknowable. You see, your problem is is that you inspired it, but he knew you at the end of the day. Yes. You you cease to be mysterious. Yes. Yes. True. That because you something. are an open and yeah, shut book. Yeah. The same book. with Philip. You see. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no way. That Sunter, could... It's always mysterious. So Sunta is always mysterious. <laughs> no, like, no. Yeah, she's very mysterious. She, <laughs> she, sometimes, she, sometimes she calls me. Uh, she's called me. She calls me Sesk, who's a very good friend of hers from when she was a child. They're still pals together. She calls me Minerva, who's somebody we used to work with. The but the most strange thing is, Asumta once called me Asumta. <laughs> well, it's, she actually it was the most existential thing you've ever done. Asumta, I'm like. Wow, that is. <laughs> ooh, we got to unpack that one. <laughs> so you made what dreams may come. So, but you had uh, Annabelle Soria, you had Robin Williams, who are no, you know, how how did they come to be involved in the film? Maxwell Seedow and Cuba Gooding Jr. Well, on top Max of that, Maxwell Seedow, wow, Ma yes. Maxwell Seedow, remarkably tall. Yes. You, you made a film with him. Yes, in 1982, uh, The Circle of Passions. Um, he's probably even taller then. Lisbon. How, so how did how did you harvest all these people to be in your film? How, how, what's the process of, I've got a movie, who is going to play my leading character? How does that work? How did it work? Well, yeah, I mean, let me not answer that question and rewind a tiny bit. Okay. Because I think there's another question before the question, um, which will answer what you're asking me. Okay. Okay. Um, when that script came to me, it didn't have a way of envisaging the afterlife, mm. which is a real problem if you're trying to do a film that's largely set in the afterlife, Paradise and Hell. And it's very easy to get into cliche. So I came up with an idea that uh, Robin Williams' wife in the story, rather than being a cook, as written in, in the original story, was a artist mm -hmm. and that she was also a fine art restorer of late 19th century painting so she created her own work that had places that they had visited on holiday Lake Como for example and with pictures of them mm -hmm. in tiny in a boat and also they she referenced these various 19th century and early 20th century artworks and her restorations so when he dies he is able to affect slightly the paintings that she continues to paint and the afterlife he goes into is a living painting and so we did this we did this <laughs> artwork for the for the afterlife of these living paintings and we won an, a, a, an academy award for it and were nominated for a second um with so it had this very strong package of visual materials that affected the script. Ron did rewrites with my input, um, and and we had just fabulous materials. And so, when Robin, in answer to your question, when Robin saw these this artwork, he was blown away, and he wanted to be part of that world and that idea. Uh, and yeah, the money would have helped. Was we, the studio that we developed was was uh, funded by Polygram, who was quite well funded at that time, and they don't exist anymore as a film company. And so he, there was twenty million on the table to Robin and a pay or play deal, um, and uh, and we met and we got on very well. We both like improv. I mean, obviously he's. A god at improv. A god. He knows, yes. a, thing. He knows yes. a thing or two I'm the about office it. junior doing the pencil, you know, <laughs> sharpening the pencils. So, you know, let, let's make it clear what, this, what the relationship is in that regard. But, um, and we worked very well together. He would always call me coach. And we would, um, we would, I'll, we'll get round to fully answering your question, but I'm kind of answering it anyway, I think, yeah. Scott. Yeah, um, yeah. And, he would allow me to do something which most which I do so often with children where you talk to them during the take and you ask them just to allow your voice to enter without showing any indication that you're talking to them and just as if it's their own inner voice and then they go into their own mode taking your thoughts as if they your own he loved that and uh, and I worked very hard to do uh, you know Robin obviously has this exaggerated comic persona that he's can pull on great skill at improvisation but he also sometimes he's also a very good dramatic actor or was 
that he sometimes wants to do things more than he needs to do. Mm -hmm. So most of what I did was um, pulling him into quite an interior mode into just simply what it was, you know, as I always say, if you feel it or think it, I'll see it. You don't have to ever show it. Just feel it or think it. I will see it. I'm on a close camera. I can see the tiniest thought going on behind your eyes. Uh, and he loved that. And so, as I say, he'd always call me coach. And afterwards, we he maintained contact. He came to New Zealand and he met with my kids and me and my ex-wife. Um, so it was like a really good relationship. So how he came aboard were to do it, was to do with our engagement was good. We were able to reach him with a power play contract also. And he loved the material. He loved the script. He was incredibly moved by the script. And then from him, the other people came aboard. And we had a lot of other great actors wanting to be part of it. It's, it's interesting. For, well, the answer, but that's it. For, the, for those of you who don't know, a pair play contract is you either do the movie or you don't do the movie, but you get paid. Even so, that does, that doesn't matter what happens. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. One of the things that we established fairly early on when we were teaching acting is that the smallest unit of information in the theater is the word, and the smallest unit of information on camera is, is the thought. And very often we train voices and bodies, but we don't train minds. And really what, what we get with um, powerful film acting is because we're actually more interested in what's going on inside somebody's head than, than necessarily what they're saying or, or doing physically. It's sort of interesting to come that, that all the truths lead to Rome. You mm -hmm. know, they all end up in the same, the same sort of a place. Would you, have you ever found... The, the conflict between acting styles I mean it's interesting because the, the there's a there's a sort of sort of a strange sort of joyous somber in what dreams may come it it's it's painfully beautiful um it's sort of um you know there's an aspect of it which is sort of you know Dante was having a good day you know um yeah so acting you've asked a couple of questions um or one question in particular. Uh, how do you balance acting styles? I just want to pick up on the previous thought again. You have so many thoughts, Scott. I have to always go back one. Right? Sorry, I'm terribly your, sorry. Your mind is so agile. Yes. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, picking up on the thought about, you know, if you feel it or or, or think it, I'll see it. You don't have to act it. Um, I, I think that what, what is often said in film acting is often the reaction, often when people edit a film, they concentrate as much on an actor's reaction during somebody else's dialogue as the person's dialogue. Reactions are as important as dialogue. So when you're supposedly on a reaction shot while someone's talking, um, and you guys, I'm sure, teach this, is finding those little beats in the other person's dialogue. Yes. So you have, you're not just waiting, oh, when, when's my line? Oh, Boom, yeah, yeah, say yeah. it. Of course, of course. It's, it's as much, you're, if, if your reactions are interesting, they're going to cut away from that person's dialogue. Yeah. And they're going to be on you. If, if there's change going on, you know, yes. if there's a beat change come, going on, even if it's boredom, you know, even if it's like, oh, fuck, please, yeah, of you course, know. Of course. Well, that, that's, that's the interesting thing about the, the beat change or, or the, the thing that the idea of, of the, what, what you're ultimately doing to tell stories is you're cutting from one moment to another. And a moment is a, is, is a change in opinion, point of view, understanding, necessity, want, or, you know, it's all of those different things. It's actually at that switch is the thing because what it has to do is it passes through a moment of uncertainty and when uncertainty happens that's when we all lean in <laughs> and yes. that, yeah yes. because if you're the same all the way through and there isn't change i'll go and you know do the dishes of course. you know no of I'm course on TV. And, 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 i mean i'd rather do something else and this change never never well no, never i mean the majority of cases they never occur when you when the other person finishes the line the, this change no. occurs in the middle or in the silence. So the creativity of an actor resides more into, you know, into the silences, really, uh, than into the words. That that is really where where the actor is free also to to so, to say so many things that could be not written. 
that cannot be written in, because it's in the moment where these things happen, right? Well, it's the the moment is also what happens is you know the the Kulachov's theory that you associate two two identical images uh, when you do one identical image with something else and then it creates a, th a third, third meaning. meaning. You know, the plate of food, the the dead child, and the woman's face. You know, it's 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 hunger, it's sadness, and it's love. There's a certain thing that happens for the actor when they go through that moment is that is another it's almost like a psychological cut that mm. forces the audience to come up with a with a third thing which and interpret it in their own particular way. Of course, way. you give space then for the people to <clears throat> to actually create their own story. Um, you know, if everything is explained and said, you know, uh, that is something that is also parallel with the work of a writer, you know, is, is, is how to retain information so that you don't say uh, uh, everything uh, to the, then because then if not, the, the, the audience doesn't have any, any job to do and is not involved, is not stimulated, no, it's not. Well, uh, the other aspect of it is also unwritable. Yeah, uh, that is also unwritable, yes. And almost undirectable. Yes, yes, and it has to come. That is, that is. I suppose it's it's a great time when you have uh, uh, such a good actor like Robin Williams was, you know, to have this to have this uh, alter alter ego, not completely filled with you also your ideas. I think that's what he really liked. It was, is there is something very? Um, I find out when I'm acting like that with someone telling me things. Um, it, it is you relax, you relax, you relax completely. You know, and you you left you know the abandon yourself to 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 the ideas and of the other, and you you like the other person is like a job of two is like dancing together, and it's so nice because you know very few times that it happens that well, you but, uh, are in a good relationship with the director, so that you let abandon yourself and you create together is is very very rarely you know, and only only with two great minds with two people that they are sensitive with, you know, someone that you actually can abandon yourself that way. You know, uh, there is a lot of other people also in the past that they, they tried to do that. And I was, and, and if I don't respect them, I, I cannot abandon myself, Vincent. It's, <laughs> it's actually absolutely impossible. It's, you, you, it, I mean, it's, uh, it's always, I normally don't talk to the actor during a take unless there's some technical problem like masking or something like that you know which there's no point continuing the take if they're masking the other actor that who you happen to want to see in a particular take um so it's a risk doing it i do it a lot with children because they're quite open to it and i would never do it with an adult actor unless they you know really worked well that way and appreciated it back to your question scott mm -hmm. um you can't even remember it i saw your eyes flicker um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm already <laughs> trying to do that. No, I, well, I'll tell you why, because I'm thinking of what... You start knowing him. What, 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 what that directing is really doing is what you're doing is you're, is you're directing thought. And thought is one of the things which is always interfered with in an acting. It's like, oh, I've got to get my lines right. I've got to do this right. I've got to make sure I hit that light and everything else. But suddenly, if you've got, you've got the, the mind of the director communicating directly with the mind of the, the character in front of them, and it's all-consuming. And if you're with people that you trust, of course, it's, it, it's a what, delicious uh, act of uh, of um, creation together. Well, right? it's truly like a conductor of an orchestra yeah, because exactly you, you 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 may raise the baton, but the man is still putting the bow to the string of the violin. So it's they're the ones who are still producing the sound. Anyway, you ha you were going to answer a question which I've forgotten. The, forgotten what it was. <laughs> what was I'm it? You're way too smart for that. Um, you asked me how. I managed to, how we how I approached such quite different actors. Oh yes, of um, course. In yes. terms of working together for rehearsals, mm -hmm. um, so um, it was tricky because I, you know I, I'm not like a theatre director who does one play after another. I do a film once every four years or five years or six years or seven, or sometimes longer. <laughs> um, you know, shush. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I'm kind of not even rusty. I'm sort of inexperienced with the rehearsal process, and, and unlike, as I say, a theatre actor, a theatre director. Um, so um, Max von Sydow comes along, 
his first language isn't English. He's not that comfortable with English. He's had to learn the lines in English yes. and remember the English because yes. he's not, you know, and he's had mm. to work on the accent. And the last thing he wants to do is improvisation, right? The last no, and, thing. And, and because... he, he, he does Meissner and that is awful. Sorry. Uh, just a <laughs> just a fan of yeah. ethical. Meisner is awful. It doesn't leave you any space to actually, you know, be in the moment. You're repeating something so, that you liked, you know, and like a parroquet. Anyway, that, that that was my problem with him when I was shooting with him in 1982. <laughs> yeah. So he somehow makes it all work. But, you know, I come aboard and I've got Robin Williams. Um, I've got Annabella Sciorra. I've got Robin Williams and, and Cuba Gooding Jr., both who love improv. And I like doing improv, right, in my rehearsals. I like not endlessly doing the same old scenes because people are going to get tired of them and they're not going to find any life in them, right? So I try to build up a history of the relationship of people um, and scenes that we don't see in the movie. For starters, that was the strategy on that particular film with Robin and Annabella Sciorra. And so first day of rehearsal, uh, Robin says, great, improv. Kiba says, great, improv. Annabella Skiora says, no frigging way till, hell, till you know, hell freezes over. Um, I'm not doing it. Annabella. Like, bomb, stop. Um, I don't need rehearsals. Um, I know how I'm going to do it. I've prepped it. I don't want to do rehearsals. So I'm going, inarticulate Vincent goes, it was more inarticulate then. I'm not anymore. Um, I, you know, I'm like, whoa. And Max von Sydow says, yeah, I don't mind doing the rehearsals, but I'm not doing any improv either. There was a pause. <laughs> there was quite <laughs> long a long pause. pause. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, exactly. I like your look. We should have got your reaction. <laughs> Did we get your reaction? Yes, do it again. Repeat. Hey. <laughs> that's me right. that's me yeah what did this you, you you did one of those to camera you did one of those <laughs> there in the spotlight the the other thing that you're dealing with is you're dealing with cuba gooding jr who's a barrel of energy you're dealing with robin williams that's a very scary room to propose improvisation in okay it's like it's like it's like, it's so, like do two on two basketball, and you've got LeBron and you've got like Shaq, and you know there's like, hey, let's 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 throw the ball about a bit. It's like, no, I'm sorry, my and, leg still hurts. And then, and then they're completely different styles of acting. The four of them. I mean, Robin likes improv, but he has really he knows the material well, and he's prepped it, and he went to Juilliard. You know, he knows what he's doing. Cuba. I don't know what his background is, very spontaneous actor and has learned the lines, but hasn't really broken it down at that stage into beats at all. So he's just freewheeling it. He just believes in totally freewheeling it. And um, Annabella, who's prepped it beyond prepped it, knows exactly what she's going to do. Um, and Max, you know, as I say, who's working in a, in a, in a, in a foreign language. So I said to Annabella, um, Fortunately, you know, I, I said to her, um, that's okay. You don't have to rehearse. Just go away. We don't have to rehearse. Mm. I mean, of course, uh, the scenes are going to be quite different by the time you come back to do them. And so that could be a problem for you. But that's entirely your decision. <laughs> Yeah. So I called her bluff, and she went after after a quite a pause. She went, "Yeah, okay, I'll I'll participate." And she was very good at it. And we did a lot of prep that really helped her character, not in terms of hitting the scene head on, as I as I said. Although we did, you know, I like to get a sense of what an actor's going to do, even if it's not exactly exactly what they'll do i like to get a know where i've got a problem and if i need to prep if i need to break scenes down so we had a scene with a Ma cuba gooding's main scene and it didn't work at all like didn't work and every actor bar one 
who'd come in for auditions, who'd auditioned for that part, they'd all failed in it, absolutely failed in it. One actor had come in, a very good English actor, well-known English actor, and he'd managed to nail it just incredibly. And um, so I had to, I had a crew of, I don't know, well, however many, 70 people or something, and the big, and massive visual effects and the whole nine yards and a massive studio in San Francisco. And I said to everyone, okay, we've got to stop. I'm going away with Cuba and we're going to break, we're going to do some work on it. So I, fortunately, because I don't, I don't break down every scene, but that particular scene I knew was a problem scene and I'd seen everybody fail at it. So I knew what the problems were and I'd seen one person pull it off. And so sometimes, terrible as it is, you learn from the people that have auditioned and pulled it off. And you can extract, and I know all the actors that are watching this will hate me for this, you can extract what one person does brilliantly and see if it will work with another actor. If you are bound to work no. with that. Or you yes. could be inspired by a certain actress. <laughs> Vincent, I, I I wouldn't mind at all if they would pay me. You wouldn't. Uh, I thought you were going to say I wouldn't mind at all if I could tear your eyes out right no. now. No, if they would pay me, you know, because it's a job. The problem with the, with the castings, I wouldn't. I, hmm. I wouldn't. You know, it's like a, in artificial intelligence. I I don't mind. Just you know what I mean. Pay me. All right. As, <laughs> as, as, as something flew from one side. Let me finish my thought because it wasn't. Yeah. As yeah. Simple. Yeah. Sorry. As sorry. Stealing yes. from another actor. It was trying to diagnose how one could do the scene. So I worked with two coaches on the scene. I worked with Penny Allen, who was like a famous actor, a coach to the stars. She'd come through the Actors Studio in New York, which I'd re originally seen her uh, at the Actors Studio um, uh, and met her. And I'd been doing acting classes with her for years as a maid, as a favour. She did them. You know, I, she didn't even charge me. She was working with Natasha Kinski and all these, you know, Harvey Keitel, all these other famous actors, right? And here's this non-entity from New Zealand. She would work with me because we were friends. And um, we'd broken the scene down. And then I also worked with Stephen, my improv uh, coach, and we broke it down. And so I'd broken that scene down, you know, to the nth degree in terms of beats and possible options and emotional beats and what, counterpoints were happening between one actor and another to try to measure you know because you always with the beats it's not just what the choices of one actor are it's the choices of the other actor and whether there's some uh electricity or whether it achieves the dramatic aim of the scene so you you might change the beats with one actor according to what's happening with it, obviously because it's like interaction humans you know they That's change true. and interact <laughs> in weird ways so um and so when we came back to do it on set, I took half an hour off, which is, I don't know, must be a hundred thousand bucks or something at least, you know, I don't know what it costs because that film cost 75 million US, you know, it's a lot of dough. So, so half an hour that you stop the whole crew after they've all set up, right, is a big deal. And we came back, my producers hated me and we pulled the scene off. Cuba did a great job. Nice. So, what so, was what was which scene? Which scene is that one? Which scene? Um, it's the scene. They about... cut it from the final film. It's not in the film. <laughs> it no, was... no, 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 no. It's it's a scene about um, three quarters of the way through between um, Cuba and Robin, basically. I can't remember even particularly the nature of the scene, but I just remember where it is and can what you, it had can to you achieve. remember what can you remember what the 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 audition that worked, what they did right, what 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 was optimal that they did compared to what what wasn't working. Well, it was incredible, and I was just I can't even remember the name of the actor, but it's a well-known English actor, and mm -hmm. um. Uh, no, I couldn't say what he did right because it wasn't one thing. It was like this guy came in off the plane, hadn't read the script, got the script handed to him, waited in the foyer for 20 min 15 minutes or something, and then did a cold reading from the script and nailed every beat. 
and it was a mother fucker of a scene to nail i mean it really was and he just he it was he had a brilliance um at reading a, a, a super intelligent guy and he had a brilliance he'd obviously done a lot of cold readings you know he just was really good at it and he could obviously scan the lines on the on on the, you know scan it digest it process it come up with the right choice seamlessly yeah i, I mean got, i just I got, was like floored do you, do you know what's funny is i, I, rem floored, I remember when i was floored sorry when I, when I was in Los Angeles, I would walk into a room because I was a British actor. I'd walk into a room and you could palpably see the people in the room going, oh, all right, we're okay now. The, the, there was a sort of relaxation because you'd been through the British drama school system, you'd been in London, da, da, da. You managed to make it to Los Angeles in one way or another, which meant that you knew what you were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the reason I know Bedford Falls is I did a pilot with Edswick and Marshall Herskovitz with their company, and they they had you know in their offices down in down in Santa Monica that looked like a kind of snowboard shop. I mean, it's an amazing. This they got this cabin in the middle of in the middle of an office. It's very peculiar. So, and uh, and that was the other thing that was sort of happening there as well at the same time because they were very peculiar in the terms of the way they did TV. You didn't have to test for network or anything like that. They'd go in. They would say, "We want that guy in the network." Go, "All right, all right. You made twenty something. You know what you're doing." You know, um, and there was it was a very different atmosphere there. But that was very much that sort of thing where you would walk into the room because you were a British actor. Everybody assumed that you would that you would knock it out of the park. It's very peculiar. The other thing that you really got the sense that you were doing is that you were fighting for second or third place. That was the other thing. It's like if none of the American actors they're pushing towards me are gonna, uh, we're gonna choose them. Then maybe this British guy, you know, who can pull it off, will get the gig. Yeah, it's very, it's very, it's a, it was a very peculiar thing. No, I, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, she's still bitter about Isabella Rossellini and Death Becomes Her because. She went to see the film and she's like, that's what I did. That's what I said in the improv with, uh, with, uh, with Zemeckis, you know, Vincent. Is it exactly. Oh. And she, she even was dressed like me in Matador. And I knew that, that, that he wanted me, you know, that Zemeckis wanted me. But, and, I mean, no, I, uh, you know, we were there for about two, two hours mm -hmm. and a half. It was a great meeting. I mean, everything was fine, you know. And um, so my, my point is, mm, just I wouldn't mind if they would pay me something, if they recognize that that's work. You see, it's, it's a question of dignity. It's not, it's, I mean, in this particular case, Cuba's performance wasn't the like this English actor, but it did unlock some keys on how you could approach the scene. And I've done a lot, as I say, I've done a lot of work with the acting coaches breaking down the scene and I spent a lot of time on it. So, but it, it, it what what the English actor had done has proven that the scene could be done. Yeah, yeah, which is which is also for you a great uh, reassurance. That it wasn't badly yes. written. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so exactly. therefore you just had to find some keys in it, which weren't the same keys that he had found but were it just meant that I had I concentrated on it and did a lot of prayer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very often it's it's um, kind of like it's sort of like rehearsal in film and TV. It, there's a great degree of it which is proof of concept. You're going is this is this is this scene actually viable? Is this scene overwritten? Are there is there too much in this? Is there not enough? You know, it's that sort of thing that you always hear the line put in an ADR. You know. We'll be there in five minutes. You know, there's always going to be somebody like that, you know, that, that is informing the audience of exactly what's going on. So um, I just wanted to segue yeah. into one other thing, um, just because it's vaguely interesting. So as a sort of out of work, first of all, as an out of work director in L.A., although that all sort of turned out fine. And then initially as an out of work, uh, also as an out of work actor, um, I did have some interesting experiences. So, um, and it's also an opportunity for you guys who are so much more experienced and eminently more talented than myself as an actor. Um, it gives you an opportunity to share you some of your experiences. So I had things like, I, I had a couple of, I had a number of really bad experiences as going to auditions. And one of them, um, it was a well-known 
American director. I, I got him because my name was well known as a director. So I, I you know, I was lucky. I got a, the door was open for a brief period, and I was with a powerful agency. I also had an actors agency back me up as agency that I had for acting as well back me up. So um, I'd get so one of them. I had to play a crazy a couple of number of them. I had to play crazy guys, and one of them I played a crazy guy, and that worked well as a film. And I was the third lead. Another one I went in for an audition, and I'm the character is hitting the the main character, you know, going totally ballistic, right? And um, I didn't know how to do that without because the the main actor isn't there. All you've got is some little wee act, um, you know, um, <laughs> casting director, demure little casting director, who's you know, and I didn't Could really. You gladly and, would. What do I do? And then. I really this guy's meant to be hitting the casting director with a stick. <laughs> the casting director, but the, <laughs> the casting director acting as the main character, right? And it was just this little wee tip, and it was like it's such a minor thing. You come in with a wrap, wrap with a roll of newspaper, right? That's wrapped up, and then instead of getting too in the face of the casting director, I got way too in the face of the casting director. Poor thing. She's still scarred and doing therapy, but um, <laughs> and you whack yourself with this with this roll of newspaper instead of hitting anything, and it was just such a. I l learned that afterwards, but it was such a specific tip of not how to intimidate the casting director, but keep it in a safety a safe zone. Another time I went in there, and um, it was a very well known actor. I think it might have been. Uh, Rob De Niro, um, and because I used to have this sort of black dimple here, right? And he he needed a character that they wanted someone who could play his brother. I couldn't. I hadn't. I used to go each for each audition. I'd go to an acting coach and a voice coach. I'd do an accent coach. So I would work on the accent, and I'd work on uh, work on the performance separately. So I treated it with quite a lot of um, professional care. Yeah, but yeah. but. I only had like a very short period of time for this one, and I had prep. I had prepped the accent, and um, Brooklyn or whatever it was, um, and I wasn't. I hadn't done improv at that stage, and this is the reason why I did improv. I started doing improv. So here's this guy sitting here, big name actor, and and I start reading the. I start. I wait for his line because this is the line up that comes in first and he doesn't do anything mm -hmm. i'm waiting for it he still doesn't do anything <laughs> and i wait for it and the fucker still doesn't do anything right and i don't know what to do and we never did the scene <laughs> <laughs> because he wanted and i i shouldn't have named it here because i can't remember who it was but it was one of those those that sort of range of New York actors, uh, and um, um, he was messing with me. He just was deliberately messing with me to see what I would do. Now, now if I was doing it, or if I, I would immediately start improvising, and provoke him. I would attack. If he's fucking with me, I would fuck with him. Yeah, of course. I would attack. I would attack. You know, verbally. But in a brotherly kind of way, in line with that character that I was meant to be. Um, but I didn't have the kind of knowledge that you guys have for doing auditions. Audition is a craft. And there's a wonderful book by a New York casting director, which every actor needs to have, except you guys, because you <laughs> nail it. And it's called Audition. And it's by, I think, Michael shree or something like that i've got it upstairs. i actually I think uh, th th this is the irony i actually think you wrote the introduction to the spanish version of it oh yes 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 it's she true. actually wrote the introduction to yes. the spanish version of the oh book. do you love that book isn't it a yes. great book yes yes it's a great book well, i i uh yeah and the the casting director is is a very nice person i met her um you know through zoom uh that was like this four, is the guy five years this ago. is the guy right i know it's a woman then I'm, I'm, sorry, no the this one's one. a guy I oh, know. Well, I'll, we'll have to look for it. It's um, no, no. It's not the same one. Then. But it's funny you should you tell that story, 
because otherwise, you know, if you're playing like a young, you know, the young, <laughs> the young Robert De Niro, I'm glad you didn't improvise yourself. <laughs> go in and go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I have to tell you, there's an actor called um, John Ashton. John Ashton plays the other bounty hunter in that brilliant film uh, by written by George Gallo called Midnight Run, mm -hmm. directed by Martin Brest from the late 80s. And he tells a story about being in a casting. I mean, I, the reason I know that, because John Ashton did a film with you, uh, an action movie called The Shooter, which I you shot with, 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 with Dolph, Dolph Lundgren, Dolph Lundgren um, in, uh, in Prague. And John Ashton is a wonderful actor, and Dolph Lundgren was surprisingly dedicated to a lot of off-Broadway shows, really wanting to improve his, his craft and, and everything else. And he loved John Ashton because John Ashton was the real deal, and he did Midnight Run and all the rest of it. That's why he was in the movie. And he said he did a casting with with De Niro. Exactly the same thing, you know. And But what he did, because he, he was considerably longer in the tooth back in the day, and he knew the story, and he knew what the score was, and he goes, he basically went, you're going to fucking start the scene or what, Bob? <laughs> he basically, he challenged them. And said, "You got, you know, you, you know, you, what, what the, what the fuck are we doing here?" I hate the manipulation thing. Yeah, I, it's, it's always I, I hated it, Vincent, from directors, from other actors. Um, manipulation is such a, a mediocre way of, of having power in a situation. You know. Um, I think because I was a director, you know, just chop, 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 maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I don't know. I uh, to me to me the manipulation when I see. I mean, of course you have to manipulate children. You have to manipulate people. But but, but you know people that they are well, not no, from I, this, I, I, this up to a world. Point. But up to after a point. point, yes, up to a point always. Uh, the idea. I mean, you know who could be uh, this guy? Coteas. Elias Coteas. Elias Coteas looks like uh, look very much like um, Elias Coteas. Have you seen him? Is, a, is oh, an well, actor from New York that is very, very, um, yeah, I did the He's a good actor. He's, he's yeah. kind of, yeah, I mean, he's, you did Tina yeah. Desire yeah. with him within yeah. Temi's yes. movie. Yeah. No, he's, he's, he's very good. Well, he's very good. Yes. It's so, so with the, what, did you have any positive casting experiences or were they all, or you know, or did you always go into castings after that and start slapping yourself with a rolled up newspaper? <laughs> no, I only did that afterwards if I didn't get the role. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, well, I went up for played a German. I went up for, an, you know, I got a lot of callbacks, um, like for Little Women playing the um, Gabriel Byrne character, the German character, because my German accent was okay at that point because my mother was German. Um, and I'd, I'd normally go in and do, I'd do the accent from the, before I came into the casting room. So when I was waiting out, I'd only talk in the accent, whether it was Irish or German or whatever. Um, so I did... Um, two films with Mike Figgis. So one was um, Leaving Las Vegas. Oh, um, really? Yeah, I just just I was only on for one minute. I'm the I'm the man jammed between Elizabeth Shue and this prostitute, and looking very happy. <laughs> <laughs> lot of acting. Lot, 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 he had to do a lot I, of preparation I didn't, I didn't work have for that. that. I just was me, you know. It was very fulfilling, <laughs> and it took us all evening night to do. We had to practice it endlessly, and you know, I was not unhappy. And um, um, and it's the opening scenes, um, and then I got as a result of that, I knew Mike, and Mike offered me this part, and I'd already been in one film over there, and I used to act in some of my early short films, um, and then I did an, another film. Because he liked what I did, um, that look of happiness. Um, they, um, uh, um, I did another film with him where I got, you know, a moderately large part, a lot much larger part, um, called uh, One Night Stand. As a, hmm. as a, a I'm going to see it. Yeah, but it, it, um, well, it's I, okay. Vincent I mean, only know. worked on the, you know, and the condition of his contract is if he would get uh, when he got home, he'd still be smelling a cocoa butter. That's <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is this there strippers you go. Use these days. Um, so, so yeah, no, I thought I had some good experiences, um, but generally, they, um, the roles came because 
someone had seen my work or had seen me or had seen my show reel. I did a lot of work on the show reels. I was living with an actress at the time, a French actress, and I'd help her with show reels and go out and film things with her in it. And then she'd, um, and I'd do my own show reels from plays or whatever. So, um, well, I'm just looking you know, at one I took night it quite stand. Seriously, for a while, I eventually stopped. Sorry. No, I'm looking at one night stand. The cast list. I mean, you had like pre-intervention um, Robert Downey Jr. You know, when he was still nuts. Uh, Kyle MacLachlan, Wesley Snipes, Natasha Kinski. Now that, that that's a cast list for you. Glenn Plummer. I was like Glenn Plummer. I always thought he was really good. Amanda Plummer. No, 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 oh, no. no, no, no. Glenn Plummer is the the choreographer in Showgirls. <laughs> amongst other things he's also the uh, he's also in uh, he's in speed as well mm -hmm. um so that was the cast of his movie that was the, that was the cast and, and also john ratzenberger um who's very famously mm -hmm. was in cheers at the time mm -hmm. yeah so so i think the the point is not so much um whether I, you know in any role as an actor it's more that as a director it was really helpful for me always and to kind of put myself at risk um because you know unless you're a born actor or naturally want to do it your whole life it's a it's quite a risk if you have a name already to put yourself out there and i think that gave me a kind of took not only a tool set but also a lot of empathy for the actors i work with um so I, that's sort of the point of that experience. Whereas some directors are very uncomfortable with actors, and particular, particularly, um, you know, inexperienced directors, they don't know what to say to them. What would you and, What would um, your advice be to actors who might be studying filmmaking right now in terms of the actor? Because everybody talks about you know cinematic language everybody talks about you know call it the the kulachov theory like i just did a little while ago everybody knows what the 30 60 and 180 degree rule is everybody knows about all those things but the one thing the most powerful special effect when it comes to telling the story is the actor but very there's very little training uh inside the film school to to actually inform people about that what would be your advice be for for directors to hone that particular tool in terms of communication with actors directors you're talking yeah i'm yeah. talking yeah. about directors oh just go to acting classes put yourself up as an actor mm -hmm. even if it's embarrassing just be an act put yourself out there go to acting classes not just as a observer not one of these sort of hollywood ones where they have hundreds of people turn up and make lots of money from it not hundreds but lots of people but an acting class where people where you are working as an actor and you are on the boards, you are up there performing, not a class where there's a few special people that are up in front of everybody and you, you know, watch carefully and observe how they do it. No, you have to internalize it. You have to do it. You have to put yourself out there and do it. And even if you do it badly, okay, what the hell? It's only some out of work actors, who cares? <laughs> Sorry, but you know, it's in terms of your record, Shots fired, much as I love every mention. out of work actor, as an out of work director often you know it it's um you know much as i the stakes are low you're not gonna it's not gonna damage your reputation you'll learn from it people will respect you for having a go at it mm -hmm. um and i never stop doing classes i mean i teach acting classes here sometimes with two different acting coaches and I normally do some specialist part of the acting class um, while they do the general class it tends to be the way I do it and do a bit of acting at the same time in the classes to try to, I mean, I've stopped doing it lately, but um, well, it's just, you it's definitely always walk, more to learn. You know? Definitely walk Never in with stop it. learning. De mm -hmm. Definitely walk in with a German accent. Never stop That's learning. That's always good. Never stop learning. That's one. Is, my name is Vincent Vaud. You know, just go in and give him full German. Yeah, up against the volume, English dog, you're going to die. You know, yes. <laughs> no, but wow, but it's good. <laughs> of course, you can't that's do what, it well and not be over the top, and you do it very well. This was it. Well, the trick. This is the trick. I the advice I always give people with uh, accents is one thing is the accent, and the other place is where the the person learned English. For example, if you're doing a German who learned their English in 
if you're a German who learned their English in New York, it's very different than a German who learned their English in Cambridge, which is very posh. You know, so the, <laughs> the, the, the modification of the second accent that you learned the English in mm -hmm. actually is the thing which gives it the sort of that little that little sort of like uh, flavor, spicy, yes. that little flavor of authenticity because uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's look you know wow, you can look into it. Yeah. you know so yeah, you got said, uh, uh, he, he had he had worked a lot with uh, with uh, in in series and also you know for for english and uh, in, in cartoons and, and and all that sort of thing and it's the and it's the sort of thing where you you go all right can you uh can can you do dutch and you're like well i'll have a go you know, uh, but it's also got to do with being Scottish. Is that I was talking to somebody last night, and uh, a, a Spanish woman. She was saying, "Why? Why do British actors do they teach you how to do the accents?" And they go, "No, it's just because all of us. There's about one thousand eight hundred accents in the United Kingdom, and it's guaranteed that if you're not, if you don't sound like Stephen Fry or you know Hugh Laurie natively, that you're going to have to change your accent. So you do." So we all learn how to do. We all learn how to be very posh and very RP and everything else like that. Well, it's like you had you worked with pa Patrick Bergen. Patrick Bergen's an Irishman, but he spent his entire career career either pretending to be English, or or American <laughs> in one way or another. It's like Anthony LaPaglia. You know, until until recently, everybody thought he was an American guy because he was always playing. He was a LaPaglia, and he thought he was like an, an Italo, Italian American. Italian American. Yeah. You know, but he's from Melbourne or something. You know, but so the, the the thing to find it interesting in terms of accents is to find out where the person learned the language. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it kind of interesting. Because mm -hmm. I know I speak Spanish, but I speak Spanish Spanish. I speak Spanish from Madrid. I don't speak Spanish from Mexico, Mexico or, or Sevilla or anywhere or, else like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, like this girl that was from Britain and had this um, this guy uh, living with her, I mean, uh, husband who was from the south of Spain, and he's a weird accent because he's uh, speaking. He's a Scottish <laughs> guy speaking Spanish, but from Andalusia. <laughs> it's like <laughs> so. so uh, yeah. There's all those sorts of things, and also some accents you find are very common. Uh, they, they they go between languages. For example, an Aberdeen accent. If you speak Spanish with an Aberdeen accent from Scotland, you actually sound Catalan. They have the, it has the wow. same sort of sounds and intonations. And the vowels and stuff, you know no? uh, you know Aberdeen. You talk like that. That's how it sounds. It's kind of strange, like. So uh, the, you're, you're talking like that for your your fi Aberdeen can can like si uh, So if you start speaking Spanish of um, como en todo bien sabes dónde vamos es es un poco extraño de estar hablando con gente en inglés sabes en castellano con un acento catalán. So there's the so you, they they kind of move between it and there's an accent for example in Berlin that sounds like Liverpool. You know, so if you if you, it sounds very, you know, on Schuligen's a bit, you know, it actually sounds like a Liverpool accent applied to German. <laughs> it's weird. It's it's the it's the the dirty intersection of 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 all these different things, which actually make them sound sort of authentic. Uh, that's going to be better and better because you know people are more global now. People are more you know uh, sensitive also to to you know uh, uh, no, there's no looping. You know, yeah. everything is going to be, I mean, dubbing. Yeah, uh, I've just been Spain. dubbing a show into English, a Spanish show into English. Sh yeah, Basque show, no? Yeah, a Basque show into English with an American accent. Mm. So I'm doing every... This is how they talk in the Basque country when they're not, you know, they speak like this <laughs> when they talk English. <laughs> so it's all, all, all of these particular things. But what, ab what about your accent? Because as, as we know, the New Zealand accent is particularly weighty. Well, I must confess you something, Vincent. I couldn't really understand you very well when in 1988, but that was because I my my English was so poor, <laughs> and your your accent was so thick that I think it was like, sorry, what, what, <laughs> sorry, say again. Well, I, so in America, I'd say, I'm a filmmaker, right? I'm a filmmaker. You know, what do you do? I'm a filmmaker. Oh, you make telephones. <laughs> they would say, you make telephones. You're a phone maker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but one thing with the New Zealand accent, uh, and I'm I'm not going to do any accents for you, Scott, because I'm rusty on my accent things, and I certainly don't want to embarrass myself in oh, front of a whole on. bunch of actors. Don't forget it. No way. But um, uh, I have to do it. Work on it. You know. Anyway, um, the New Zealand accent is very similar to a number of the southern accents because they've got diphthongs or triphthongs. You know, um, so I 
um, and extended vowels sounds, uh, you know. And so it's normally much easier for a New Zealander to learn one of the Southern accents than it is to learn a standard American accent. So I'm sure that's true for each country. I remember when you were in LA and you initially, Asunta, you were working very hard on your accents and you had that, you had that sort of sound, you had a sort of harsh sound that you, that you now don't have anymore when you speak English. But that was very, you were finding it very hard to get rid of that. Do you want to talk about that at all? Because that was really interesting. Yes, well, I, I, I had these two coach. I mean, the problem I had back then is that in New York, I had a, a, a terrible, terrible voice coach. And he was so pushing and so, um, um, I don't know, disgusting with me, you know. He was like, you know, considering myself, I don't know, I was like, I was crying all the time after the class. So I, I, that, that really uh, put me in a very bad position to actually love what I was doing, you know, the, about the accent. I was, I, I, I was afraid uh, to speak because this awful man that I had in New York. <laughs> and he was the best. I mean, people paid, I mean, $300 an hour for this guy. There's certain people who kind of confuse that with good. It's like if he's going, no, 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 or something, you sound like the goddamn maid. Yes, you know? yes, he was like that. I was like feeling so small, you know, and so and so impossible. This, the, you know, it was like the distance of you know Titan there, and uh, it was it was awful. So that that was a problem because uh, that happened in 1986 or 87 when the first time I I went to 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 the states, and and then well then I had to really like someone to be able to really you know wanting to do it and. And, and it happened. It happened two years later. Uh, that was uh, 1988, more or less, when I when we met. I think it was a is a is a nice, you know, English um, um, English teacher. And it was Andrew a friend. And no, no, that was a, no, no, that was a friend of of Mickey actually, who said, you know, this this woman, I think it's going to help okay. you. And and she was very good. I did Falcon Crest with her, and I did other things. Um, little by little, I met other people that they were also. Uh, famous uh, voice coaches but I had to go you know uh, I, you know I learned that this thing of an accent is 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 like taking away where you're from uh, all you know and sometimes it can be very painful because the conceptions and the misconceptions that the people have are for the other country you know and I always felt less you know in Paris for instance I felt less because I was from Spain I mean, you know and Spain and Portugal were you know the south of Europe and they were really the you know the well good, I don't, don't worry good, about that you'd feel less in Paris if you're from Marseille yes you know what of I mean? course yeah, that's God forbid too. you're from Canada <laughs> Yeah, yeah, with Canada, you know yes, that I mean? made them laugh. Pretty rough. Yes. Anyway, they were very rough, the French people too. But uh, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it touches something that is, is, is really your roots, where you're coming from. And if you feel alone and like how you can feel in, in a country like, like USA, you, you, are, you are really, you know, in a very bad place, you know. But then little by little, you know, when you see people see you like, for instance, Italian, and I say, okay, so I can try doing English, Italian, <laughs> English with Italian accent. Well, that's and, easy. And you, you just need to do that a lot. Yeah, that a lot, yes. <laughs> My so, God, so. I mean, and, yeah. I think the point you're making, which is the same point I was kind of referring to, which is there are certain um, accents that your accent is more akin to, and that it's easier to get roles where you feel more comfortable with the accent. So you're not just playing the accent, the accent's coming a little easier to you. You can play the character and not just play for the accent because you're nailing the accent. And so it's identifying for an actor what those accents are that are easier, a little easier for you to learn. Yes. And then targeting, especially targeting those roles, like you're saying Italian or some of the roles, some of the accents that you were saying, Scott. I mean, not. I'm not a brilliant vocal person. I'm more of a vi visual person. So for me, targeting um, Southern characters was a little bit easier. Probably a New York accent would have been okay, but I never really learned the different accents in, from New York, although I could have if I'd pre been prepared to put the time into it. Um, and then the other thing is I found 
you have to you needed to working in LA but applies anywhere identify who you might be credibly cast as yeah you know and so I could have been cast as anyone with an Italian or Hispanic or whatever background at that stage because of my dark hair and dark dark eyes at that point um i dye my hair now to get this light <laughs> white color you know. i have to do it constantly he's doing the, i'm trying to make myself older and more dignified what he does is he, he's, <laughs> he, he's moving into the silver fox demographic that's where he's just decided to take himself I mean, currently it's an entirely different angry. type of lady he's interested in <laughs> <laughs> this is really a wig. Let me adjust it. That's My it. My dark hair is not showing, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Bald as a coot. Black hole of cut cutter. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah, that's the thing, um, is is that I would I would get sent for castings and I would go, Listen, I'm many things, but what I am not is an athletic marine. You know, that's really not it. One of the things that got that really made me leave Los Angeles was it was script after script, which any role I went up for, where I was, I was just the evil bad guy, because if you were British, you were the evil bad guy. <laughs> it, it, was, it was incessant that it was just you're the evil bad guy. It's it's curious now because the relationship of British actors and acting is entirely separate now. You know, we're looking twenty five years later, where film and television is absolutely lousy with British actors doing their best, you know, their best murk and accents. Um, I'll give you an explanation why the southern accent is easier for you. It's because it's so extreme. It's like it's like being able to step entirely into a different room. And it gives you so many, there's so many vocal things that you can recognize and hang your hat on that you don't necessarily get if you're doing something which is less extreme, sort of Midwest, Californian, etc. But if you go in like Louisiana, deep, deep south, then, then it's quite straightforward. New York is also quite straightforward because you're channeling your in, inner gangster. You know, because of you've seen and Irish is quite straightforward. Irish is quite straightforward. I found Irish quite straightforward. But many of us come from, uh, you know, uh, Irish backgrounds right. in New Zealand, and so there is. Uh, well, yes. they they have this thing where the 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 Australian and the 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 New Zealand thing. You know, when you've got pin, and pin, right? You know, very hard to do. Even Meryl Streep, and when she played this Australian, couldn't nail the accent, uh, an Australian accent. Well, you mean the dude guy's got my vibe, all or, that stuff. Or, <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to do it, to pull it off, um, um, except for you, Scott. Except no, you. no, but, no. Um, British actors are pretty good at Australian accents because we grew up watching Neighbours and Home and Away. That's one of the oh, things. Right. You know, in performances. But Australian the New Zealand is pretty hard. You know, and even to the extent where it was satirized, the famous line from a bit of Fry and Laurie, he goes, you know, performance is the bottom line, Clark, and I held myself accountable in no small measure. You know, there's this, the, 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 but it was always in, that that was always the sounds that we had that were from Home and Away, you know, Kylie and Jason, you know, and every single every single Aussie actor has has been through that, all the Hemsworths, all 19 of them, you know, they've all, all gone through that, and then, the funny thing is, the last time you saw Andrew Jack, you worked with him oh, yeah, on that. a casting. So Andrew Jack is the guy who did all the voice work on Lord of the Rings and every other film you could possibly imagine of that Andrew scope. was my, ve my, my best voice coach. I mean, he was no one like him. And, uh, you know, I paid also for him, not the production company many times, because I, I really wanted to you know, to, to, to be part of, you know, of his... Yeah, the only trouble is by the time you're finished, you're going, none shall pass! That was all you were doing <laughs> back in the day. No, no. No, he was great. Uh, he was great. And uh, But let, let me let me tell yeah. you the, 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 the strange connection of all this. Mm -hmm. That was, you were putting together, you did a self-tape back in 1994 for the film The Frighteners, directed by uh, Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson to be shot in New Zealand. Mm. There you go. It's a, it's how a small... many, how many, remind me, I think it was up around 300. How many films have you actually acted in? Well, between the TV shows, I mean, I know that there's 20, 28 leads, I mean, um, uh, protagonist parts. Um, I know that is, I mean, IMDb Pro must say that. Oh, I'm, uh, ju I'm just having a look, sweetheart. <laughs> Give us a second there. Eh? IMDb Pro, Pro. How many, how many films, actual films? Uh, I, uh, without TV. 
Well, I think it was. It, uh, let me see exactly the name. That's see that, that that's classically New Zealand films. Films. How many films <laughs> as opposed to films? There's the. Uh, is that sound yeah. right? Let's, uh, according yeah. to this, you have done 128 movies. 128 movies and 50 or something uh, TV series. Yeah. Yes. Or. Wow. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And you've also been. You've produced 20, 26 things, directed eight. You're a second or assistant Shorts, director on five. Only short. Wrote four, art director on four, casting director on one. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but there is a long time. I that should be interviewing you guys. <laughs> there, is, there is a long time, Vincent, that I, 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 I don't know why they don't give me roles here. I suppose it's because the age. I suppose it's because also I don't like very much a lot of people that they do films <laughs> you know I've you're not a, a big fan of auditioning either <laughs> i'm not when a someone has to do a self-tape that's no, it the world's that, over it's no, like the I, seventh level of hell no, I, don't, I don't want to audition that is the reality Dan i don't think that is fair you know at 66 after all these movies i did and all these series of television i don't feel like going to prove to anyone you know what i mean it's like okay go go and see my movies no, because you know what I mean? You understand, right, Vincent? But uh, here people don't understand. You know, here people still, you know, they they are in the the peak now of these casting directors. You know, uh, so you have to anyway. But what I'm interested also is is about you now. So what what are your interests? Because I know that you've been doing a movie also, no, in Germany, I think, or no, in oh let me oh let me fill you in on that. But just want to follow up on one thread in terms of what you were saying. Um, if you're an experienced actor and a name, a star, and people have seen your films, you know, there's no reason why you should audition. However, there's an interesting, in my opinion, however, and many major name stars won't audition. But what they, what often happens, which is interesting, is they'll do a meeting, the person will do a meeting. And you can guarantee when the actor does the meeting, they will subtly indicate how they would play that role just through how they talk about that character in the meeting. Of course. And they communicate that. So you could walk, if I was doing a meeting with a well-known actor, you can guarantee they have really prepped it. And they will indicate to me subtly I will know by the time I walk away how that actor would approach that particular role. And I think that's kind of interesting. People forget that. Yeah, um, people forget that sometimes, you know, is is when you have an experienced actor or actress in, in front of you, I think that, you know, the only, um, I mean, the fact that he's already there and he has passion about the things that that uh, that he had read or the things that you are telling or you know as a, as a director so the communication on these meetings is much more important than anyone else everything else you know what i mean are you as the op actor open to being directed do you of course. have some sort of simpatico kind of thing going on with you that you can work together um of course that's what you like that? exactly no, that's what you should the, find are out. Are the dates going to work for that actor? You know, um, just you know, a lot of a lot of sort of information, a lot of things are, are kind of resolved leading you, up to and during that thing and afterwards. Of course, in a he, meeting, here's you an don't interesting. Have to. But here's an interesting thing. Somebody, this is interesting. I got cast as a lead in a movie uh, based on a an Irvin Welsh uh, story, Ecstasy, and I was cast as a lead. I went and did an incredible casting because the character was where, was from where I'm from. His background was my background and everything else like that. I'm totally different from the character in every other way, but those are the things that I could draw on. I went in and got the job. Then what happened is I got to know the director personally, and the director realized that well, what... No, you got the job. I got the job. He stole you that you had the job. He, I got the job. It was completely legit. I was his guy. And then I made the mistake of getting to know the director. The director realized that I'm not the guy who auditioned. I'm not the guy who did that that audition with the text and the speech that I had to make because it's a speech at the guy's at the father's funeral and all the rest of it. And I knocked it out of the park. 
he realized that I'm not that guy. I'm not the kind of lost hedonistic um, loser. He went and one day he said to me, he said, you know, I got to tell you, I made a real mistake that you're, you're really the mentor of this piece. You're, you're the voice of reason. You're the wisdom amongst this group of friends. I can't have you. And I was like, fucking brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Note to self. <laughs> get the job and walk away. Turn up on the first day. That's that 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 was really it. It's much better sometimes, Vincent. And I o- never work. The other thing is that sometimes the people that you know really well, uh, you know, they're never going to be the ones that are going to give you the job because the mystery is gone. Yes, I never worked with 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 friends. Never worked with you. Never worked with Philip. Never worked with you know the people here that they are friends. They don't see me. It's like <laughs> it's like hey, I'm an actress, you know. <laughs> You know, you had this role that I could play. <laughs> what, 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 what went wrong? Well, you know? it's a separation between the person and what the person can do. Working yeah, with Pablo yeah, Moreno, absolutely. who did the film Red the Libertad, I asked him, I said, what was it like with Assumpta afterwards? And he said, she was doing stuff that I didn't see until we got to the, the editing room. She was, doing st- she was doing stuff that was so small, so intimate, and so precise that mm-hmm. I never noticed it on set. Yeah, and with this guy, you know, I, I worked four times already, no, five times Yeah, with Pablo. And just, you know, there is, I, I, you know, but it was when I was 50 that I played this role and I met this director. Before, it was always with all the time, all these movies with all, another director. Isn't that fun? Uh, is it, mm-hmm. It's funny, right, that, that there is no someone with, you know, I always had a secret envy of the people that they... You know that they had like a director that would come. You know. You're also Mastrioni, for example, Ma- Marcello Mastrioni, always doing these Fellini films, for example. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's because you're a very you're you're a feminine force to reckon with, to be reckoned with. Uh, there's cer- there's certainly something about that. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, I don't know. You know oh, but anyway, we are here to talk about Vincent. <laughs> I want to know about you, <laughs> about what what is your, uh, your what is your mind now? Oh, okay. Well, I look. I did this film in, in LA, What Dreams May Come, won these awards, Academy Awards, or won Academy Award, and, um, and but I kind of was sick of LA afterwards, and I decided I wanted it. My father had died, and one day I'm in the Hollywood Hills, in my house in the Hollywood Hills at that time, and um, this wild deer comes up to my back door, just a wild deer in the Hollywood Hills. And it's like two meters away from me. I'm inside the kitchen, but I can see through the French window, French door. And it was as if my father, I, I don't know why I thought this, was as if my father was visiting me. And part of it was that, you know, I'd been on, this was around 1991, I'd been on the set in the Arctic. Um, I'd been on the set, and no, it was in Montreal on this particular day when my father died. I couldn't go home. And I had, I just kept filming. So I filmed, I didn't take any time off. My father was dead in New Zealand. I love my father beyond measure. And uh, I just kept working and I didn't take an hour off. And so when I went back, when I went to LA and these many years later and this deer came to my doorway, somehow I thought of the deer as my father. I don't know why. Yes. yes. And, um, and I thought, you know what? I'm being called home. I'm, I need to go home. So I, and I was sick of LA. I was sort of becoming in LA is such a there's great people I had there, great friends like your Sunter and, and other people. Um and but you become one of them after a while. You become this person who has to suck up to everybody all the time and you can very easily lose a sense of who you are. And I'm not interested in losing a sense of who I am. So I can't do that. I don't want to do that. I'm very centered about who I am. And so um, I, I went back, I had a project, so, and I had, also there's a certain ruthlessness there in LA and an endless ambition, and you get sick of people who just talk about what they're going to do next, even when they haven't got anything next. Boring, you know, boring, yes, boring. Boring, selling themselves. You know, they always say about New Zealanders and Americans, with an American, you divide everything they say by half, and with New Zealanders, you double everything they, they say. <laughs> now, I may not be modest because I've been to L.A. and I've had the operation <laughs> now. You can see it. They're there yeah, listen to, uh, listen to Vincent. It's not half a double. It's pretty much what he says. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's about all um, there is. 
<laughs> so when you go to LA, you have to double everything you, you say you've done, you know, or exaggerate it. Um, so I wanted more authenticity. I had a couple of stories. I came back. I did a a, a, a film that had um, Kiefer Sutherland in it when I came back, a big um, 19th century epic set during the New Zealand wars between Maori and Europeans about a woman going to live in the rebel camp, enemy rebel camp, and which was not a done thing at the time, based on something that partially based on something that had happened, a couple of different stories, um, with a female protagonist. Uh, and um, I did another film where I went back into a Maori community also, and and a drama documentary. I spent another couple of years re making a different film some of it out of documentary material I'd filmed 30 years before, some of it dramatized material and some of it interview, coming back, stepping back into the story, but finding the story behind the story of who this woman really was, who'd been this Maori princess. But when I'd first come to her, when I was 18, she was impoverished. She had one, one handi mentally handicapped son or mentally disturbed son rather, at paranoid schizophrenic son who was violent and I lived with him for many years when I was 18. So 27 years later, after she died, I went back into the same isolated community, interviewed 60 people and dramatized her stories and, and turned it into a feature film. It, it, it won, it, and which also did quite, you know, well in terms of the award circuit. Who, um, what was this movie called? It's called Rain of the Children, but spelt like rain, raining. Like it's rain, raining rain children. Of the children. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I was very happy with that film. I think it's a good film. Um, ah, nice. It won, won a film festival in Poland, a, big, a large film festival in Poland, and um, and was, you know, very well respected. Um, but then I, I was sick of film and I stopped. And I, as I'd gone to art school, I decided to have a career as an artist. I went to the Shanghai Biennale. Um, I took over as we were saying before we started talking live, um, I took over a cathedral, I had video installations and large paintings that were part prints that were something like 15 meters long scrolls that hung from the but, 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 but how, the how, did, how, did, how did you paint? You always were painting or that was... How, um, no, I liked painting when I was younger and now having done a lot of visual effects, I did a mixture of painting, drawing, photography and composite work, you know, so involving Photoshop, easier to do now, not so hard, to, not harder to do then. Um, and created images, I'd go out and shoot elements, and then I'd also do these um, installations. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my idea, I thought maybe I can have a, a career as both an artist and as a film director. Um, so I did that for about seven or eight years. I wrote a couple of books um, and the last, feature film I tackled was in Ukraine. I was there in late 2020 through to half of 2021, working with a 70 person crew and a bunch of wonderful actors who I love to death. Um, one of them's high up in the army now. I've still stay in contact with all my actors. I've done improv classes with a group of about 100 actors uh, in in Ukraine. But how, how, did you, how did you end up, uh, end up in Ukraine? Who, who, I mean, what was this? Well, it was this, well, it was this film about competitive sailing and small dinghies, sort of chariots of fire on water. And uh, I got approached by the German producer because I have German citizenship, because they needed a German who was also either lived in Australia or New Zealand. And it had a Swiss producer, a German producer. And my, my friend just, I was looking for a European director, asked for suggestions, and I said, hey, what about me? <laughs> yeah, in that particular context, you're kind of like the one-legged lesbian Vietnamese person. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's not a lot of you literally kicking around. I mean, it's so we need a New Zealander with a German with a European passport who happens to know how to do. Oh, I've got one. <laughs> I've got one. How did you know that? Yes, exactly. No, so um, they like my films, um, and. So we began work on it, but they weren't fully financed. So it's sort of on hold at the moment, that film. I did um, 25 days of shooting. We shot really lovely stuff. My actors were great. I lucked in with some a young actor 
um, who just was a seven-year-old who just was unbelievably unbelievable talent. Um, and so that's on hold. Seven years that, old, you um, say? Yeah, seven well, years old. Well, they, they, yeah. they, they don't look seven anymore, old boy. No, and as I say, my lead actors in the army, you know. So I and stay in contact with them. Um, so that's on hiatus. I don't know what, what's going what to happen is, What is the title of that one? It's called Storm well, School. It's currently called Storm School, yeah. Storm School, okay. Not to be confused with White But Squall. I don't know what the, what the ultimate fate of that will be. Well, the interesting um, the interesting thing with that is is part of the, part of the story is, is sort of what happened, really, is that it would be very hard to just is. go on and finish the story without saying... You know, there's a, you know, there's something happens around, you know, halfway through the second and act, we, which we is. Have, we did, yeah, we did explore that, but I think we missed a kind of window of opportunity, you know. Um, so, um, so I'm back. I have various projects I want to get off the ground. I've got, um, I've stopped doing art shows for the moment. I've a lot of art shows here. Um, a lot of it was what? Super art expensive. Shows. Art shows. art shows. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Yes. You see, you see, this art is the expression. thing. What did he say? <laughs> art, art shows. <laughs> art. Art. Yes, yes, yes. Good, good. So sorry. tell me, tell me. Sorry, Vincent. <laughs> so I did, you know, I did a lot of work on those. It was great to have a different career or back to what I, how I'd originally started when I first went to art school and developed that. Um, and I have a couple of projects I've been working on that I am hopeful they will get up and going, but they're more expensive than a small New Zealand film, so it doesn't suit the funding here, which is designed for very, low, very very low budget. We'll see some mid-range. Um, so they're designed so, for a low budget to be shot there. It's not, it's not a sequel to no, What Dreams May Come Cold When We Have Shuffled Off This Mortal Coil. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're um, mid-range, mid-budget mid range. Okay, so, um, but so but you're require... not looking then for 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 money from states, no? <laughs> yeah, we are because they're oh. mid range. You can okay. only get a ah, very okay. low budget mid range. New yes. Zealand. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, New Zealand. Otherwise, we'll have to assassinate film. Jane Campion. <laughs> exactly, with Jane is, and Peter, of course, are the exceptions, and Taika. You know, uh, um, uh, so it's always tricky to get those mid range films financed. When so you say mid range, sort of is, is how many million? 20 mil US, 20 mil US. Okay. 25 mil US, that kind of range. Yeah. It's always tricky. I've been lucky to get a number of those films made that are independent, remain independent, and aren't to Hollywood, you know, have a sort of, you know, they're more original than many of the Hollywood films are. Um, so uh, that's where I'm at. You know, we're just. I'm waiting for some financing to come in. I'm hopeful it'll come in. I'll probably know in the next two weeks whether I have a film greenlit this year, um, and we'll see what happens. That's so, great. so your normal day is about these things of art. Is like you have ideas and you do something right in the moment one day, or, or you had another idea. No, look, you know, like most, like many actors and many film directors, you know, if you want to have do if you're at all fussy and you want to do what you want to do you have to have often have to have uh alternate income so i basically rent out my place and things like that and keep it keep, i have to have some um money coming in so i spend some time doing that so i do i you know, have Airbnb and stuff here. And I mean, it's just a reality, you know, you go through waves of your career. And, um, uh, and then that allows me the freedom to keep pushing hard to get these um, features off the ground. So I recently did a three month trip to Europe, as you know, based in Germany, I went to Denmark, saw Last One Trees Company, um, went to Sweden, was in England, sort of uh, trying to looking to package up the two different projects I've got. So working as a producer to try, on my own projects. Being the producer of your own project. Yeah, at least okay. the initiating producer. Yes, yes. So yes. that's so I sort of have this varied 
career and you know sometimes you're on the way sometimes as um steven spielberg says sit on jaws some days you eat the shark and some days the shark eats you <laughs> yeah well you you know that old joke you know why the actor doesn't look out the window the window in the morning because if he did he'd have nothing to do in the afternoon <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a painful one. <laughs> it's but, a painful so, one. Yeah. Right, we have so, uh, so um, we yeah, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Sorry. So, so what, what, Vincent? Sorry. So, I mean, basically, I make it up every day and work on the projects I want to work on, and sort of fly them and see if the wind gets behind them. So it's a highly, you know, it's a pretty speculative. It's always been speculative, so it's really no different. And I've been very lucky to make the films I've made, but I haven't made many. I've only made about seven features, you know. It's very, it's very interesting what the experience of being in LA and seeing the deer. The, there's a there's a shocking thing which most people don't realize that up in the canyons in Los Angeles, that just sh feet away from you is absolutely savage wilderness filled with stuff that it will kill you. That's running around. It's all over there. But the other thing that always struck me um, when people ask me why I came back from LA is the thing is that there's absolutely no texture to anything. Everything was built, you know, the oldest building is in 18, is 1880. You know, the, the house that we're sitting in right now was built in 1856. You know, the infrastructure of, of the world, the European world is so dripping. You know, we did a play in 2022 in a Roman theater that was built 60 years before the birth of Christ you know and it's still being used as a theater you know and it's utterly and completely authentic that lack of texture is the thing that you begin to get hungry for yeah that has also happened well yeah and and for for me too was also that you know that i i had my to solve a lot of problems with my father that at the time you know i was really fighting that, against that vincent needs a certain amount of rain yeah also <laughs> <laughs> There's a sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, that is, I'm Scottish. It's I not miserable. That. I'm not happy. If, I, if it's not miserable, I'm not happy. Well, but I yeah, it, I, yeah. It, yeah. It I found that LA, at some level, can dehumanize you. You have this great group of your friends, you know, that are. Yeah, we had it. You know, we had it. You're yeah. Australian, European. Yes. But it's this. It's this sort of blind ambition for a lot of people. And that turns you into something which, and that's turns you into a sort of person that I don't actually particularly like, those kind of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need a certain amount of drive and ambition, sure. But what counts to me is the voice and the quality of what you're doing. There's another thing which I noticed when I was there is, is how people's, people's own opinions become anesthetized. Yes. Is, is there's a sort of numbing of opinion and everybody becomes gray because nobody wants to piss anybody off. You know, nobody wants to go, oh, you never guess what Vincent said about that movie. He said it was a steaming pile of horse shit, <laughs> you know, and it's like, really? He said that? I didn't know he was that opinionated, <laughs> you know, um, perhaps we but, should, but, think, you know. But also you get, I mean, related to that, you go to see like the head of a studio. So like when I first went there, I'd go and do all the meetings with heads of studios um, and I'd say to them, so what films do you like? And they'd say, I like this, this, and this would be sort of like art films or intelligent. But they would, and what films do you make? Well, they'd be kind of, you know, dumb and dumber and, um, you know, some sort of stupid action movie that you felt, you know, you got a visceral kick out of while you watched, but at the end of it, you felt like you'd had terrible, you had digestion problems afterwards mm -hmm. and, you know, some dumb actioner. And so there's always this, they had what they make often and what they like were two completely different things. Mm. It's interesting. Film it, for a it's interesting. Mm. Why, why there is this mistrust on what they do, right? Or well, because the, the films they like didn't do the nu uh, box office numbers no, yeah, of but the films. Yeah. Go sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no. So that's why the discrepancy between the what they liked and what they felt they had to make. What were you saying, though, Asunda? What was your point? No, no. My point was was just that you know that sometimes uh, movies um, you go and see movies uh, with a with a kind of a of noise. I mean, no noise. Uh, taste. A taste because you see that these people had passion for it. 
and you can actually identify it very quickly. The, the, the ones that they really need to express or something or say something from the only formula, whatever. Yeah, but uh, the, other, the other thing we're dealing with is you, you got to remember that we're dealing with films which, the, you know, these days, particularly if we're talking about studio movies, where there's an awful lot of money on the table. Not even in... Not even in pre-production and post-production we're also talking about a lot of money on the table in terms of advertising and everything else like that and then you take something like the latest indiana jones films which which cost more than 300 million dollars and they messed it up profoundly you're also dealing with you know in particular the, the you know the last 20 years where they basically discovered the algorithm to print money which was the marvel movies and that ran out of steam eventually because what that did is it is it is it stymied the creation of new actors, new stars through the creation of original properties, which people could fall in love with. Mm -hmm. People fell in love with characters, but they didn't fall in love with actors. Nobody rushes out to see a Chris Hemsworth movie. They're going to see a Thor movie, perhaps, but not a Chris Hemsworth movie. So that thing, which is like eighties, you know, eighties, nineties movie stars, just they don't yes. exist anymore. Well, I, I, but also the, the director, the director star, because we had we had star directors. You know, we had the Scorsese. We had we had some some people that you know that you had people with original visions. I mean, with, look, the, there's still the and, Tarantinos and that, of the world. There's uh, you know yes. those people are still out there. Yes, but they're still out there, but not doing really what they mm. like to do. Well, he's doing exactly what he wants to do, and which, he's and which he's was well. What his, no no what Tar what Tarantino does is Tarantino makes Tarantino movies. You know, and there's a point where you go, is this? Did he make this or is it a satire? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's uh, it's a little bit like it's the opposite of what Spielberg did. Spielberg became less Spielberg as he's gone on. He's attempted to become less and less tricksy and more eh, just elegant blocking. You know, but none of this, none of the tricks that he pulled out before. It's interesting, no, to understand that. Uh, I mean, I have a question for you, Vincent. Like. You know, what do you think that the director also needs to have as a team? A producer, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know, uh, the head of a, of a studio. What do you want from a producer? That's a good question. Yeah, what do you want from a producer? And Or is it just they stay the hell out of the way and give you the money? I think the reality is, I don't think, look, I you know, endeavoured to make films that were like smaller, you know, more artistic movies and larger movies that have some artistic integrity, but, are, you know, are more mainstream. So those two different categories of movie are, normally have different styles of producer um, because those producers for each of those two categories have different agendas. So for example, if I was doing a mid-range film, a company like Working Title would be great in London because they do mid-range films. If I do a small film, I'm more likely to be, and even for mid-range and small range, you, you're likely to be using um, some sort of uh, shooting incentive in a particular country. And it's probably got some cultural boundaries of what the story is and where the actors and where most of the actors come from and where the crew comes from, where the director comes from. So they have a cultural agenda. So it's a different producer. It's a homegrown producer. It's a, like a New Zealand or Australian producer. They work on much smaller budgets. They're not so much gun for hire producers. They're, as with Tim Bevan at Working Title, they're both very loyal to the director and give them, give, and you hope, give that director a lot of room to move. It's not always the case. You can get corrupt producers in any category where the movie's more about them or the money they make or they're not very loyal. Loyalty is a big thing. On a bigger film, on a studio film, you're likely to be working with someone you've never worked with before that, uh, that you know, has somehow managed to get a film through the studio system. Again, they may or may not be loyal. Um, but they're different breeds of producer. They're different. They they they're not likely to be the same person. It'd be great to work with the same person, but very seldom that happens. Um, the the big thing for me, and I went to a talk with Jane Campion was giving the other day uh, about six months ago, and she said something I've always thought. 
a director's very exposed. They're very vulnerable. If somebody starts manipulating, it's very easy for a producer or studio or anybody to ma manipulate behind that person's back. It's very e easy even for your assistant to manipulate your situation. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, I saw that eyebrow little twitch. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, phone make phone calls in in the evening to the studio or or if somebody that wants to, is ambitious and wants to be a producer, you know, not be very loyal to you as a director. So um, the biggest thing comes down to somebody that's prepared to invest in your vision and has the loyalty and has loyalty to back you up. And as Jane said, you need someone to watch your back, a producer that'll watch your back because you're super exposed. It's interesting seeing that because there's a point, and I certainly I've experienced it uh, as as a director, where you you've been talking to somebody who you thought you could trust. You know, you've been spilling your guts, dealing with them as a collaborator, as somebody who you know you you were working with towards the common goal, and then you discover that the exact opposite is true. That you've it happens all the time. It happens. You've been all in bed with a seventh columnist uh, and every single thing that you thought that you were saying in confidence is basically being placed in a memo to go elsewhere. You know, they're basically looking yeah. for a reason why you're a liability. And then when you I discover that, what you do is you just go, everything's fine. Everything's fine. And then what you do is you sort of close down, focus, do exactly what's necessary, keep your head down and just get it done. You know? Yeah, no, it's tricky. I mean, I did a, I did a, um, when I was working in San Francisco, I, I got invited to meet with Francis Ford Coppola. And so I went to his place and it was meant to be just a 20 minute meeting, but he decided to cook me dinner. I'm lucky. I've had Vim Vendors cook me dinner. I've had Francis Ford Coppola cook me dinner. <laughs> Vim Vendors like sort of did the soup thing, which is pretty easy to make. I don't know. You they, they may have thought you needed to eat. He something. loves. He loves you. I heard a lot of no. No, he's great. I love him. I love yeah, him. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. And I remember and Francis. When, yeah, I was talking about you when when I was um, you know I worked with him for, for eight years with Vim Vendors. I was wow. the representative of Spain in the European Film Academy who he's the, the the president of it and chief cook and bot bottle washer and apparently <laughs> soup maker yeah and he always had a, a, a very good word about so you. you you were you were having dinner cooked for you by francis for coppola the way you do yeah put on some pasta for me right you know good italian um you know post italian person and uh we ended up chatting for about three hours and he said i said what advice do you have for me because i was about to shoot in san francisco then and he said, um, now, if I get it right, he said, always fire on a Wednesday so the person that you're firing doesn't have a chance to regroup. I was amazed at how nuts and bolts his two comments were. And in those days when people had monitors, not everybody had, they didn't have big monitors and they didn't have, you know, a lot of monitors on set. There was just really the little monitor that the director had. And now, of course, everybody can get it sent to their office while you're shooting, you know, mm -hmm. in another continent, sent it to another continent. And he said, always make sure you have a small monitor that you can put between your legs so no one else can look over your shoulder. <laughs> so it was all about trying to defend your ability to be the creative head of the movie and not be messed with. Mm -hmm. Even at Francis Ford Coppola's level. Um, wow. And that was in 19, 1998, 1998. Even then, at the peak of his career, having done Apocalypse Now and The Godfathers and, you know, and become a successful wine grower, um, a vintner, becoming a successful vintner, um, that was his advice. It was amazing just how nuts and bolts and practical it was. It was about it was about defending your position. That's uh, rather sobering, isn't it? Yeah. When you you know when you well, get when, when you see also that it's a teamwork. I mean, you know what I mean, and that we are not able to actually, you know, being straight and being you know creative and you know have a a nice dialogue between us is is sad, no, Vincent? 
Well, it should be, but if there's a power struggle, if somebody feels, you know, if they've got their secret director activated or they just feel, you know, I mean, the worst comment you ever hear is when a producer says, look, I don't act on behalf. You know, I, the thing that counts for me is I, I, I act on behalf of the audience. When you hear somebody say that, walk, run, run as fast as you can away from that person because that means they're a frigging know-it-all and they will cut you up the back as soon as look at you because they know better on everything because they represent they think they represent the audience they know better but they don't direct themselves they probably don't write themselves they just happen to have got this god-given gift it's come down and they know exactly what the audience likes yes because he's uh, he's Darren really truly inspired well, well, the, but the run. other thing he's, is he's run, the only run because don't stop running <laughs> he's the only spectator that counts well it's also the first place <laughs> exactly. I, I i heard the expression when somebody said oh who's he um it said oh he's the future ex-head of the studio you know the idea is that sooner or later they're they're just going to get fired and they're going to be turfed out like everybody else. Yes, of course. No, I mean, I mean no. The, the the climate of fear is palpable. I saw an actress but, fired between the read through, and the first day of shooting. You know, everybody was like, "I was like, uh, where's Sheila?" It's like, we don't talk about Sheila. Okay. But I think this is a point you brought up when we were chatting the other day uh, about um, always needing to be respectful of people and. Sometimes we fail. I fail sometimes. I'm a grumpy old bastard at the best of times. But um, and I think the point you were making, Scott, was that the person that's your assistant or this or that in time is more than likely to be your employer um, as their career grows. Uh, and with actors, I always divide the world into two in terms of working with actors and the ease of working with actors, I, I really divide actors into, particularly stars, into two types. The ones that have humility and have some sense of kindness to other people, and even under the stress when they are bad tempered and do bitch at someone inappropriately, that they then, even if it's the least person in the crew, they apologize. They say, look, I, I know I was a bit out of turn, you know, I was a bit out of sorts the other day and I shouldn't have yelled at you like that and you really didn't do anything wrong. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, and to the to the to some assistant on a large crew, they'll apologise. Robin Williams was like that. He was grumpy and often grumpy and, and preoccupied. He wasn't the entertainer a lot of the time. He, I used to call him the stealth bomber because he would... You never knew when he was on set. He liked to watch the set, and you never he'd sneak up, <laughs> and you just never knew. So if you had said Robin's been a pain in, the, oh, oh, hi Robin, and I'm nice <laughs> to see you. I love working with you. You know you're always so good to work with. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but he had humility. Keeper Sutherland was like that. I found always a professional, always knew his stuff, always on set on time. And then a couple of people who remain unnamed I've worked with were, well, I have a letter in the alphabet that oh, yes. the word I describe them with, and it's the third letter in the alphabet. It's, <laughs> it's what we call a see you and, next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and they are, they have been right ones. And, um, but, you know, and, none of us is really that important you know of course yeah, yeah it's i mean sometimes you act badly and you regret it we're human or it's uh, emotion emotional but it's really important to try to be a decent person if you can if you can yeah. find him i always thought it was hey, very my name's fun Adolf hitler or heinrich himmler it's a little hard to find my inner niceness yeah <laughs> the Vincent Vaught. Um, I I always thought it was quite funny when they were they they emerged a recording of Christian Bale losing his shit because a director of photography was messing around with lines in the middle of a scene that he was shooting an intimate you know emotional scene on a Terminator movie, and he lost his head and he's like, "What the hell are you doing? I got I'm we're trying to do this here. Please don't do that." And so, you know, and he was screaming. He was very angry. And he was like, "Get out of here." And I remember they spoke to a few actors and they were going, so what did you think of that? 
And I remember George Clooney went, you ever been on a film set? <laughs> you any idea how complicated this is? You any idea that what we're trying to do when there's like hundreds of people looking and we're supposed to, you know, come up with this stuff? It's very frustrating sometimes. I think he went easy on him. You know what I mean? And everybody was looking for it. And that's just what happens. The trouble is you don't know whether it's been engineered to make you fall. No, I mean, that's it, a certain thing that I got when I knew I was getting pushed, pushed to breaking point. Is a, is, is a great, um, uh, how you say that, is, is a great ability, really, to be on set, to, to, to know what is your position in set all the times, even if you are not, you know, not a working actor that day. But, but it's, it, it takes a lot of ability to understand your position. You know, I always love to be to be in sets, even if I'm not shooting, even if it's not my movie, because I, I learned a lot from that. You know, in the, the, my first years of my life, like uh, being an actress, I, I was like, okay, so that that is the person. Oh wow! So that is uh, so. When you understand, you know, the, the the struggles, then you can you can you can actually uh, be a leader for and curate you know, the, the, the egos of people so that everything goes smooth. I did it in two or three movies. I, I, I became, you know, the, the savior of the, of the actual <laughs> ego <laughs> problems that they were there. And I think an actor or an actress, when he has a, a lead part, can do that and must do that. Well, you have a very important leadership role. You are the acting department. Ex exactly. And people will follow your and, and you know they will follow your lead. If you got if you have somebody like you're talking about, like if you got a, like a star or a, or a big actor who has humility, everybody else will calm the hell down. You know, they, they everybody will hopefully chill a little bit out because they'll see that the guy who has the perfect right to lose his head uh, doesn't. doesn't. Yes. Yeah. It's yes. a it's a very peculiar and, thing. And it's very important also the transparency I think for a uh, point of view of the director and also the writer. There's no manipulation of anyone, you know? Like trying to be as 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 transparent and as as, as positive and and as, you know, um, a team worker, you know? You know trying to 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 stimulate the best of everyone. That that is something that a director, the actor the main actor or main actress, the, the, the producer, must do on set, really. That is what it, it gives the tone of everything else. If you don't see, I, so many movies I did where, you know, something was wrong with the producer or the, wrong in the sense that he didn't, he didn't want quality or they had big fights between the director and producer or, you know, things that they, they, they were very apparent that this thing was not really <laughs> going well. Uh, and then everything starts to disintegrate so, so rapidly that, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to sew it up because everybody is like losing faith on what they are they are doing it's so easy to do that and it takes a lot of you know people from the outside sometimes to to solve the problems we recently had a um, a, a very big series of television that uh, had always uh, had also a problem and that we've been working on um, and 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 really uh, it, it helps a lot to have a force that is that is new to be able to saw no to to reinvigorate again a movie set. Well, what and we it, did it. We, well, we really did it. Well, what it is? It's like an occupying force. It's like it's like what it's an occupying force that comes into the middle of a civil war. So what you do is you have a civil war, as we know, war is never civil. But you got this <laughs> these these two factions which are fighting between them, and then somebody else comes in and goes, "Hey, what are you doing?" <laughs> What the, what, what's this? We're supposed to be making this thing, and you're all uh, doing this nonsense. Can we just get the plan? You know, the 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 shooting schedule right, and and go to work, please. You know, you too. Apologize, and let's move on. I'll fire you. You know. Oh, it was. I think it's is important to have people like that in a set. That should be uh, sometimes a producer, but of course the producer is. I I see it like as a spiritual guide. You know. It's like Alec Baldwin's character in Glen Gary Glen Cross when I, he uh, when he comes in and he's like coffee is for closers, you know, because <laughs> you either sell or hit the bricks. No, but no, but it's not that that particular leadership. Do you know what you need to sell real estate? pair of brass balls <laughs> yeah that's what it is what's my name fuck you that's my name <laughs> that's my name that's fuck you that's my name <laughs>
Anyway, it's, 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 it's not easy for a director, for sure, to maintain, you know, all this po positive, uh, when you see that there is someone that, you know, has all these struggles of power and things, must be not easy. And, and it's, it's, it's a great, you know, it's a, it's a great ability, I think, for a director that must have, you know. But I think that all comes from transparency and, and dialogue with everyone. Yeah, but right. that that's very nice. But there's a lot of the time, if you're being transparent to people who are going to use that intelligence, let's just call it that, against you, then you're doubly screwed. I've tried that transparency trick. It doesn't work. Because what you're doing is, you know, you're there to dance. The other person power. And they're there to make the you fall over. Power. Sorry, what, Vincent? One, one, you're giving the other person power if you're too transparent sometimes. One last brief story on in line with what you're talking about. Um, uh, it's your night. It's your night, and it's party time in Spain. But it's true. Here, it doesn't matter. I meant to be. Working, I meant to be working. Although this is much more fun than anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I had a problem with the with a um, twelve year old girl that had a mother that was um, you know constantly watching and sort of making herself conscious as we were as she was acting in this film map of the human heart when i was shooting in montreal and she was a fantastic kid and wonderful little actress just absolutely wonderful and very authentic and i said tried to say nicely to the mother that you know look can you give us a break and then she still hung around the set and then i asked again and then she got her nose out of joint and and um and the film stopped you know because girl was upset that her mother was upset and then everybody was upset with me because I must have pissed her mother off but I didn't think I'd said anything you know except to say something nicely and luckily I was working with the wonderful Jean Moreau and Jean Moreau was like the leadership um Jason Scott Lee was also wonderful this other this American Chinese actor um but Jean Moreau had been in so many films and I just loved her. She's just so nice to work with. And and she took this little actress aside, this little girl, Quebecois, part Cree Indian girl aside, and just wooed her back into being in a good place and explained how the sets work. And she she just, she looked after, Jeanne looked after me and looked after the film and made sure it stayed on track and was the perfect example of the sort of thing that you're talking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, um, it's in, it, you he know was there for the movie, and you know Vincent's a pain in the ass. Everyone knows that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I got. I have to tell you that I have done this job. So the, there was a job that I did. I was on for three months a TV show, and the director was a psychotic despot. And uh, anybody knows I've talked about it before in other circumstances. Eventually, my job was to maintain morale of the actors. Make sure that they didn't throw the towel in because otherwise nobody was getting out there alive. And also, ultimately, it was like I was kind of like a perambulating therapist for the crew because a lot of people had a lot of stuff that they wanted to talk, talk about and deal with and understand what the hell was going on. So there's that aspect to it. The, others, the other aspect is what I do as a, as a coach sometimes is I always say just as the director of photography has a gaffer, to tell you know to actually put the put the correct light where they they might want it that my relationship with the actors is i'm the gaffer for the director so you go the director who's who's got a million things on their mind go i need those guys to do that and like this and you go all right so you translate what the thing the the, the director will want and then you'll get them to do it it can be it can be such a huge help you know it can be such a huge help having those people that are in sync with you and for your vision of the movie, oh my God, um, makes a difference. We should, we, I should let you yes. live yeah, your Yeah, we should get on. Because we, we were supposed to see a play 15 minutes ago. Oh my goodness. That's it's why true. I was pointing at the oh, clock. Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Anyway. I'm not, I'm not actually a pedant. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to go You know, I help Vincent. Vincent Ward, we should, write a pro we should write a book on procrastination, you and me, but I'm sure we've got a lot of other stuff we've got to do first, you know. May I say, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to what talk to you guys. The pleasure has yes. been so ours. Much. Very much. Well, I know that, but I just thought I'd say it anyway. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks very much, mate. Yeah.
<laughs> Don't believe it for a second. <laughs> right. Well, we are, are, are we are we by tomorrow? Uh, back tomorrow. Are we live tomorrow? Or are we go? Some, you got something else on? No, that tomorrow's Friday. No, that's okay. Okay, so we're gonna be live tomorrow. Yes, eight. Yes, okay, yes. we'll be live, which is eight a.m. in <laughs> Nueva Zelanda, <laughs> in New Zealand, uh-huh. New Zealand time. Eight a.m. You must come to Spain <clears throat> and thank you, Vincent. You know, uh, let's talk production. Exactly. Exactly. So well, um, I do mean to come and, and visit you guys, but I um, I will do that. I will do that. I just haven't got to Spain in a while. I'll, I'll, tell, C- I'll tell the Festival of Seed just to invite you this September. Next time, yes. Okay. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps See you guys. Can... Lots of love. Okay. Take care. Bye. bye. All right. Vincent. Bye for now, Vincent. Bye. bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Take care. Bye. bye. Igual. Take care. All right. I sign off on this. Yeah, yeah. That's I'll trying you. to work out how to do it. Right there, we go. All right. So um, that was that was our show for tonight. How wonderful! Yes, how wonderful! M- it was uh, closing on three hours. Yes. Uh, but a magnificent filmmaker, Vincent Ward. Go and uh, watch his movies. He's worked with the best. He's he's uh, had his toe in some of the most uh, polemic pieces of filmmaking during with the eighties, particularly the nineties. Well, with Alien Three, The Last Samurai, and I always remember him. He had this kind of this sort of stare stare because he was he was in the middle of of like battling with studios and and everything else and trying to be a normal human being anyway let's finish it off for tonight thank you for d- dropping in hopefully we'll be doing this more often it's very nice of him because he's in new zealand which is eight o'clock in the morning there that's when he started and um we'll see you all soon thank you very much for still being there and uh, as we say we'll in spanish uh, mañana ma- mas y mejor and um upwards and onwards that's the one Right, so we got to go off to Micro Teatro por Dinero because there's a play uh, with somebody part of La Familia del Cine. A La yes. Familia del Cine. Who we're supposed to go and see. Pablo uh, Valera. Yeah, uh, Pablo Valera, and his play is called El Cranio de Goya. Exactly. Uh, and we're going to have to rush off right now. Thank you very much. Remember, subscribe and follow and touch the bell and all those other great things. And uh, we will see you all soon. This is Scott Cleverton. And. Asunta, sir, no? Signing off.